don't you come on downstairs? Come on up. Don't worry, we're not gonna jump you. Nothing, <laughs> nothing sinister happening down here. Yeah, it's it's just a, orbs. it's just America's longest podcast, the Pod People. I'm, I'm Matisse Van Rossum, and I'm looking for a girl with a short skirt and a long oh, legs. Leg yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ben Sheets, and I'm in my Bogdanoff bag right now. I'm Cleveland Mosier, and I'm laying it down. You can call me the long leg of the law. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that, uh, that cake is coming to carry in a couple of weeks? We could I go, could not care less. <laughs> we could go see them. We could go see cake I, in just a couple of weeks. I love their style of talking. Yeah. You know what? I still kind of like cake. Cake is a couple of decent sense. tracks. Yeah. I'm not actually, I don't actually want to go see Cake in concert. I loved him in high school. I don't, um, I haven't really listened to him much since then, but. Yeah. They got, they got a couple of good tracks. Yeah. They're all kind of the same, though. Um, anyway, we're here to talk about Long Legs. Long Legs. Uh, we went and saw it last night, the the new film from Oz Perkins. Uh, he's going by Osgood now. Yeah, his last couple of movies, he's uh, he's credited as Osgood Perkins, I think, because it sounds more professional. But in all of like the interviews I've seen with like Micah Monroe and Nick Cage, they're all calling him Oz. They're throwing yeah, around. I don't funny. give a shit. I'm calling him Oz Perkins. I called James Cameron Big Jim. Yeah. It's a, it's he's, a he's a good. Silly. He's a good friend of mine. These are friends of mine. <laughs> I know these people I, <laughs> personally. I know Oz. He's a good guy. I know Big Jim Cameron. He's fucking cool. Arnie, y'all know who that is? Sly? These are all my friends. I can call them what I want. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Long Legs, new Osgood Perkins movie uh, starring Nick Cage, Micah Monroe. Uh, certainly, uh, I think, my most anticipated film of the year. We saw it. Before we talk about the movie at all, I think we should talk about the marketing campaign behind this. Yeah, this um, movie had a ton of viral marketing. I, it did. I, I tend to not like gimmicks. There was pretty fun gimmicks here. Before we even get into that, I will just want to say the most important thing off the bat, got to get it off my chest. Long legs is false advertising. I've spent weeks, <laughs> weeks now, mm -hmm. fucking using a series of weights and pulleys to stretch out my legs, They're to make long. them as long as possible. I got them so long that I had to scuttle into the theater like a spider. Mm -hmm. And I fucking saw this movie, and I saw Nick Cage, and his legs are of average length. You know, and, and it, it's really crazy, like, as, as someone who can, you know, this is an auditory medium, so visually, let me let me describe Tisa's legs. How long my legs, and beautiful my long, legs are. They also have, like, concentric rings of stretch marks on them. Yeah. And his his feet, because of the, the, the pulley process, um, his toes have swollen, and some have fallen off, and he just he just looks like Big Bird from the waist down. Yeah, it's true, and um, and you know, and Nick Cage, his legs not even that long. I got out of this movie, and I googled Nick Cage height. He's only six feet tall, and that's his reported height, which means in reality he's probably more like five eight. Damn, I'm taller than Nick Cage, especially now with my incredibly beautiful long legs. They should have made this movie about me, but instead. They made it about a guy who does not even have that long legs. Fucked up. Do you Zero think out point? of five stars. You know, Nick Cage <laughs> is a big method kind of guy. He gets really into his characters. He, he has his own ever... method that he calls like neo-shamanic. Uh, <laughs> the neo-shamanic <laughs> school of so acting cool. or something. He's so cool. He is so yeah. cool. Uh, do you think at any point he asked to have prosthetic longer legs for this movie. I mean, he like had his, didn't he have his like teeth filed or some shit for that Nosferatu movie? I don't think so. Oh, okay, I had it right. I don't know, that might be a, a, a an internet fact that's wrong. Yeah. Um, which, which, no, are you talking about Renfield? Yeah, yeah, I am. No, he was wearing fake vampire teeth yeah, in that. I thought, yeah, I thought that they like, they did some kind of irreparable damage to his teeth or something. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I'm aware that, yeah, that he had also prosthetics in there. It's pretty hard to miss yeah. in that movie that those are not real teeth. But I'm pretty sure that also did something to his mouth. I heard about that in an interview. I like something. to think but... that he he asked Oz Perkins uh, to... I mean, he was a producer of this movie, so he probably had some say in how things were budgeted. I like to think that he asked Oz Perkins if he could go to Russia and get that experimental leg lengthening surgery <laughs> that, Jeez. like, gives you, like... 
two extra inches and it's like excruciatingly painful and also like you're much more likely to like break your legs after that because yeah. it's like you're like it's less like bone, you're like less bone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like look i know i'm naturally gifted with height but like i just cannot imagine anybody being like so insecure about their height that they're gonna spend like hundreds of thousands of dollars on an extremely painful experimental Russian like, leg. You already have two surgery. other options. Like one, wear pumps. Two, be a short king. Yeah, be a short king. Like, exactly. Yeah. If you if you end up in any kind of like situation where like somebody is like threatening to hit you, just be like, hey, I'm just a little guy. You know, do that do that oh, I'm just a little birthday boy routine yeah. and, and they won't hit you. It's like I can't I can't do that. And you can. I could, but nobody would buy it. <laughs> But you're so tall, they still wouldn't hit you. So yeah, really well, it's, and especially now, now I'm uh, now I'm freakishly tall <laughs> yeah, with my yeah. with my long big bird legs. <laughs> you're like uh, you're like that uh, that one guy from It Follows. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think they like just. That. I think they just like found that guy. Like I think they just like saw him on the. Street. No, they were just filming the. I I, know, I remember this story like extensively. They talk about it in the behind the scenes. They were just filming that doorway, and he just walked in. Whoa, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know tuned into America's most misinformational podcast? Did you know that Nick, that in this movie Nick Cage just showed up to set and he just looks like that? Yeah, now? it's like that's what he looks like now. Yeah, I, I heard he was beset by bees. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I heard online. Uh, um, okay, yeah. So to get back to the marketing campaign, to for talk this, about I, the movie, yeah. yeah. Uh, to to ease ourselves into the movie, um, yeah. This, they the neon like really like pulled out all the stops on on this marketing campaign i think correct me if i'm wrong but i think we saw the first trailer for this movie like back in december yeah and they didn't have the name attached to the trailer it was different runes and it didn't show what it was called yeah no, i'm pretty sure it's i think it does i think the legs. yeah i think the, I, the, the characters does, like do turn into trailers, long legs. they don't have any uh name on it specifically yeah, so they they posted a bunch of youtube viral videos as well where okay. it's clips and snippets of the runes and it was in the encrypted kind of code yeah that they have. i think i think the first one that we saw in the theater did have it the title because i remember I, I looked it up last night i because yeah i was i was looking i remember specifically also like okay, maybe seeing... i saw it at a movie before you guys maybe i i definitely saw it where it just anyway was very obscure. very very good early evocative trailer doesn't uh, reveal much of anything except it's the, the best vi- kind of trailer. The vibe. It's, it's just the the aesthetic um, and the tone of the film without capturing the plot elements. Yeah. It shows very little, and also just stylistically, I think as a singular piece of art, it's it's a really good. Tra- the trailer's got a cool name to it. Also, I forget what it is, but it's like you know something along like the 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 teeth the, the, the teeth of the hydra. Yes, uh, the teeth of the hydra in your flesh or something like that. It's the same. It's the same quote from the fucking, uh, I gotta pull up the lyrics, but at the very beginning of the movie, there's the T-Rex, uh, the quotes from the T-Rex song, uh, Bang a Gong, um, Mm -hmm. that if you don't recognize that title, you've 100% heard that song. Yeah. Um, but, uh. T-Rex is used quite a bit throughout the movie. There's multiple T-Rex songs in this movie, and I don't quite know why. I Um, I love it. T-Rex is awesome. Notoriously, I, 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 I try to avoid trailers. I don't. I don't like them generally, uh, but I will say I, I liked that trailer. And I was lucky enough, I think that's really the only trailer I I paid attention to. I'm not saying it's the only one that crossed me, but like it, it, it at the least like that was the one that definitely had my my eyebrows raised and thinking like, oh, this this could be good. I, I, I went in pretty neutral uh, because I, I just I'd heard a lot of the surrounding dialogue around it, lots of hype. And in this case, it was enough more to put me off. Than to, to put me onto it. Um, the, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the name of that trailer uh, is uh, "You've Got the Teeth of the Hydra Upon You," oh, and then they did two trailers after that, which were named "Dirty" and "One Sweet," because the lyric is "You've Got the Teeth of the Hydra Upon You." You're dirty, sweet, and you're my girl. Get it on, bang a gong. Get it on. And like we see that at the at the after the cold open of the film, mm-hmm. uh, and that song is the over the credits. But yeah, so like over the course of like six months, they just gradually release like new trailers, teasers, lots of posters. They're very like big on the aesthetic, but crucially never revealing Nick Cage. 
his name is attached, it's all over it, but we ne- we don't actually see him. And then within the last couple of months, they started to sort of ramp things up exponentially. There's They posted that billboard, I think, in L.A. with a phone number on it where if you call it, there's a recording. Which of, we did. Uh, yeah, we did, of, of long legs. Uh, being creepy and that weird. was my favorite part of the marketing. I, um, I, I thought that was that was really funny. yeah. It's really like, because yeah we we all we did it together. Like you mentioned it, and I was like, hey, let's yeah, let's call it. It's so, like, yeah, it's like thirty it, seconds. Yeah, you did it on yeah. speakerphone, and it's it's like Long Legs is leaving you a fucked up like voice message taunting you. Yeah, and again, it's a gimmick. It's silly, but like I I don't know. There, there's something about like being able to sort of reach out and touch the movie. It's a fun way to build hype for this kind of thing, yeah. and like. Even in, like, the last week, like, they didn't stop. Like, we just, you know, on our last episode, we talked about Maxine, which just came out a week before this. And once Maxine came out, a bunch of people were, you know, logging it and writing reviews on Letterboxd. And a mysterious account without a profile picture named Mr. Downstairs started commenting on a bunch of these Maxine reviews in, like, the pictographic, like, Zodiac code that the killer uses in this movie. (laughs) Just on random people's Maxine reviews. And then they sort of top it off at the end in the last few days where they show a clip from the scene where Micah Monroe and Nick Cage, like, meet each other for the first time in the movie, and they blur his face out, but they were like, Micah was wearing a contact mic on oh, her. Oh, I started her, that trailer yeah. last night, and I read that text, and I rolled my eyes and shut it off. Yeah, so they're like, she was wearing a contact mic. <laughs> like, that's lame. She was wearing a contact mic the first time the, she saw Nick Cage as I've long legs. I've seen these heartbeat trailers before, like, and I... And it caught her heartbeat going, really? fr- going up I, I to... I have seen anyone do there that There have before. been, there have been one I honestly I couldn't tell you what movie it was for, but they've done ones where like we hooked up heartbeat monitors to the audience. To I think the it was like audience, paranormal activity sure. or whatever. Else like I, that. I, I to, yeah, to the audience for for, yeah, for like the drugs. the paranormal activity stuff where they put the cameras inside the theaters and capture everybody screaming and stuff. Yeah, it's one of those things. But it's like yeah, Micah saw when she saw Nick Cage on set in the long legs makeup for the first time. Uh, her heartbeat skyrocketed to 170 BPM. I don't know, and it's like you can hear, like, listen to her actual heartbeat. It, whether that's true or not, whatever. Doesn't really matter. And and a lot of people have been sort of cynically being like, there's no, like, this is all dumb and hokey. Like, there's, every time people are like, this is the scariest movie ever. Like, it never turns out to be as scary as it is. It's like, yeah, sure. Especially if you're a horror fan, you're desensitized to being quote-unquote scared, sure. right? Whatever. Like, this movie didn't make me piss my pants or anything. But I do think my point in all of this is that, I mean, this this marketing worked. Yeah. Like, we saw it last night because we were going to go tonight, but, like, all the showings were full, Ben, you and I are thinking of going to see it again on Sunday, and I checked showtimes and, like, pretty much all the ones tomorrow on Saturday, full. A lot of the ones on Sunday, full. Like, this is on track to be Neon's best opening weekend ever. Good. For any awesome. movie, sick, That's and we'll you know we'll get those final numbers for our predictions next week. Yeah, but my point is, is like they put a lot of time and consideration and thought into marketing this film, and I think it's already we we've seen paid off enormously yeah. without even saying a thing about the quality of the film itself, which is high. Yeah, I I think there this is a. A movie that d- definitely deserves success. I, uh, I think the the marketing is really creative, and like usually marketing, you know, gets a bad rap. But like all it is is drumming a pipe for something. Yeah, they did that excellently here. And know? again, I think so. you know there are a lot of people being cynical about hy- how they're trying to hype this movie up as like the scariest movie you've ever seen. But like. I don't know, man. If it yeah. gets people into the fucking theaters, and yeah, it's I mean, like they've been doing that since The Exorcist. Exactly, you know, like... exactly. It's like that's a common that's a common shtick, and it works. Mm-hmm. You know, it works. Every time I see it, I'm like, well, there's no way that's going to be the scariest movie I've ever seen. But it always gets me to go see the movie. You know, 
I do have critiques. Of the marketing or the movie? The movie. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Which we should probably get into the mood, the, the yeah. substance, I think, yeah. now. Let's, um, yeah. let's blanket but it was spoilers. Right, you know, if you're interested at the marketing, piqued your interest, definitely go see it. I think, you know, even with critiques, I think we all would say it's interesting enough to see on the big screen. 100%. Oh, oh uh, yeah, I, I, I would say it, it's a film that, that really calls for it. So so much of this, this film is... Um, built around mnemonic devices that it i think it's a great aid to fill your vision with it i think the sound design is excellent too oh, yeah. so seeing yeah. that in a theatrical setting where you have a great sound setup helps the movie a ton yeah i would not expect this movie to be in dolby but god damn i wish it yeah. was oh, yeah. man, how look how Honestly. good it looks Seriously. and sounds like man i would kill to see this yeah, movie same. in dolby I'd... but yeah obviously blanket spoilers we're gonna get we're gonna get into spoilers and, and i think too like again like the, the less you know even better i know that the trailers did a good job of that and the yeah. less, but even still just I, I I would I would even still like recommend avoiding the marketing and just watching. The movie. Well, yeah, and I I do think and to to sort of get us into the movie. Um, obviously I the the marketing worked on me like a fucking charm. Like from that first trailer, I was like, this is my most anticipated movie of years. Like this is a movie that is tailor made for me, and and it is in in many ways. But at the same time, it is also not what I was expecting from the marketing. So I don't th I think it is one of those cases where even if you've ha even if you have seen the trailer what the movie actually is is still at least took me by surprise in a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, and like a lot of the mar the marketing compared it favorably to Silence of the Lambs. And you know, there is something to be said there with like the similarities in being both being sort of police procedural serial killer mysteries yeah but they are very different movies yes and yes. you know and yes. don't go in expecting silence of the lambs silence it's of the lambs is obviously different. a huge influence on this film no doubt but there are also several other huge influences on this film yes. that don't telegraph themselves quite as much yeah. as the silence of the lambs compared that was probably the the biggest bit of like hype around this movie that had me go into it as neutral as i could and i agree with you too like when i when that first trailer popped up and they have like the sigils appearing across the screen over for those shots like that i mean oh god it's so fucking cool and the aesthetic like like i'm right there with you like that's a that's a dream theoretically like that's a dream movie for me yeah like that's that's everything i would want is like a cool like a cult serial killer film like fuck yes sign me up i'm so on directed by oz, oz perkins, perkins starring micah monroe and nicholas cage yeah, like yeah, it is ideal that's great and that's why golden. i tried so hard to tamp my expectations down because i didn't want to go into this movie and be thrown off by it or let down or disappointed because uh for the same reasons that like comparing it to one of the best thrillers ever made is just unfair yeah like to any movie uh and, and yeah no one is like, gonna be john no one is ever yeah. gonna be jonathan demi but i like i no. do you know I, I i do think that we're like silence of the lambs came out 30 years ago so like i i don't think that it's uh I, I mean, I, I think it's fair to to try to capture the same kind of thing. Like, right. oh, we're we're at a point far enough removed from it that like there's room for a quote unquote new Silence oh, of the I mean, Lambs. Frank, frankly, like when it, in terms of subject matter, mm -hmm. like uh, th these movies could have come out the same year, and that would be fine sure. for me. Like, um, at, at the end of the day, like, def it definitely is different. Like, homage is fine, but also like at a certain point, like it's hardly even homage, and it's more just like painting with the same palette you know what i mean like they're using a lot of the same uh, like material like not like 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 they're using a lot of the same like uh m material but they're doing something very different with it like the picture that they come up with is, is quite different yeah no that's know? fair honestly like what... i don't i don't mean literally like the colors of the movies i mean like like in terms of like substance right like... yeah no no no. i see i see what you're saying um uh, so we've we've talked about two Oz Perkins movies on on the podcast before we did uh the Black Coat's Daughter and then we did uh Gretel and Hansel um yes. I love the Black Coat's Daughter I know Cleve does too Ben's a little less hot on it um and I think we were all pretty underwhelmed by Gretel and Hansel you Cleve you liked it quite a bit at the time yeah I'm yeah going going back uh to revisit 
my take on it then. I, uh, I I don't know this for sure, but I'd be pretty willing to bet that was one of those circumstances where I came out of the movie and was like, hey, jazz. Yeah. yeah. And um, well, it is... if, I, if I'm going to be real, I, I look back and I try and remember the film and i and I, I remember like some of the beats but like when it comes to the horror of it and the whole midsection with him actually interacting with the witch yeah. i couldn't tell you what happened and exactly I, I honestly couldn't like um exactly it's, i want to revisit it at some point but it had a great great aesthetic great production design there was but something was... about like a like a like a big pit filling with something but that that's honestly all i have <laughs> yeah good good aesthetic some of those good visual sensibilities but a kind of empty uh un- uninteresting film um but i i say all this to to yeah, mention big, that great. like Love Black Oak. I was really surprised by how much this movie long legs feels just like a straight up spiritual sequel to the black coat's daughter yes really yeah i, I think yeah they're, they're they're essentially in the same world like, i i see similarities but you know i i think this is way more developed obviously two mo- three movies down the line yeah well it's in some cases i i, I actually think uh this one's developed for the worse yeah i i i think this i don't know overall like in, in a broad sort of narrative sense, this movie is trying to do very different things than The Black Coat's Daughter, but it has a few, like, very specific, like, through lines yes. that are Satanic almost... Satanic elements. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that more specifically as, as we talk about the movie, but, sure. but yes. Um... And I, I'm really glad that I've had the chance to sleep on this movie. We saw it last night, and we didn't just come straight home and record. Because I was, I think, a little thrown off by what I was expecting the movie to be versus what I got. And being able to, like, literally sleep on it, I think, has done me a lot of good. Like, I... Not no exaggeration. Like this movie didn't scare me, but like all of my dreams were were long legs based last night. Like I was I was literally thinking about this movie all night. I, I thought this movie was terrifying. I yeah. think it's yeah. very unsettling mm-hmm. in like a a non jump scare type of horror. Yeah, way. absolutely. Um, and we can get into in sort of yeah, it's sort of like a bone a bone deep dread kind yeah. of way. Yeah. yeah, it's it's very much like that. But yeah, I I'm glad to be coming into this conversation, um, uh, as as our as our vice president Kamala Harris says, <laughs> looking at what can be unburdened by what has been, because after all, I didn't just fall out of a coconut tree. Yeah. We exist in the context of all in which we live and came before us. So, uh, you know, having a chance to, like, really sleep and reflect on that I think has been good. Because I came out of this liking this movie, and I'm at the point where I think I love this movie, but I do still have some misgivings that I hope I can sort of develop a more defined opinion on through the course of our conversation. Can I give, like, a loose plot? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think it's on time. the highest level. So essentially there's a string of uh, strange uh, familial murders that are going on uh, where it seems like uh, one of the family members, the father, usually the father, almost always, yeah. uh, kills his family and then kills himself. Seemingly <laughs> completely unmotivated, but there is a letter that's left at each site, a series of coded messages with the only word that's legible being long legs. Mm-hmm. Signed. Ads. Signed long yes. legs. Yeah. So the FBI puts together a task force to try to figure out what's going on. And uh, Mike and Monroe, our lead, is on the case and trying to solve it. That's yes. the, the highest level summary. We can go into detail. Yeah, it's pretty back yeah. in the box. But, uh, it's good. Yeah, I, I I was trying not to spoil anything, but I think you know the familial stuff is super important because it I, I think that's one of the big themes of the movie is kind of playing off of the the juxtaposition of horrible things under the surface of familial wholesomeness. Sure. And Americana. Something I wanted to touch on prior to the the, the plot is uh, you guys had mentioned like you were terrified by this film, you were chilled by it. And it left you having to to think about it. It filled your dreams. Um, 
Uh, I too. I, I took a I took a really long walk uh, after after the movie. Well, I just kind of cleared my head, thought about that, and uh, came back home. But what I have to say is, I was thinking about the complexities of it. But for me personally, during the film, I was mortified. I, I found this film to be chilling. I felt trapped inside of it in a, in a way that is indicative of the themes. We'll get into that in a bit. I have a lot of really fun, I think, kind of takes on how even the, the cinematography plays into the themes of this film um, in a way I haven't, I've hardly seen before. But by the end of the film, I was no longer terrified by it. And like, I came out of it much less chilled. I think like being in it was great, but we'll 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 talk about that more. But I just I just wanted to touch on that while we're talking about how how yeah. well our experiences around it. I I see I see where you're coming from and agree to an extent, and we'll we'll get into that once That's we talk about the third act. One of the the final scenes in the movie uh, was one of the most terrifying scenes to me. Um, but we'll get into yeah that. yeah, yeah. Scary, well yeah let's let's not um, get ahead of ourselves. But yeah, so we've got our we've got our setup like you described it, Ben. This is very Silence of the Lambs. Mike Monroe is like a she's she's a very young new FBI agent, like fresh out of the academy. Um, I think in Silence of the Lambs, Clarice is still in the academy at this time. Um, but yeah, on the on the hunt on the trail of you know a, a horrifying serial killer. Um, I do think there's even some parallels in, like, the sounds of their names. Her character's name is Lee Harker, Clarice Starling. Her, like, boss is, like, Agent Carver. And <laughs> Clarice's boss in Silence of the Lambs is Jack Crawford. Um, sure. But it, it, it does, yeah, it, it extends so much beyond this. And, well, and honestly, it, it, it really sets itself apart sort of, like, right off the bat where they kind of set up that like Michael Monroe's character is psychic or like half psychic ha half psychic or whatever it's like they yeah they they start with like she's on a task force like looking for a different serial killer and she's on like uh you know door knocking duty with some other agent and like while he's at one house she has like a premonition that like that house across the street that's where the killer is. It's that number. It's it's that number. I know it. Like he's in there, and the other guy kind of laughs off. He's like, "There's no way you can know that." He goes up, knocks on the door, and is just shot in the head. Um, and you know, so she chases the killer into the house and arrests him and whatnot. But then after that, like the FBI, like puts her through sort of like it's like a void cop test. It, yeah, it's like a void cop it's test, great. kind of to like see if she's psychic. Where it's terrifying, it's alienating. Like she doesn't yeah. know why she's there. We don't know why she's there. She's just in like a big '90s coated beige like room. Um, with, like, wood paneling and shit. A lot of wood paneling in this movie. It's great. Um, and, uh, there's a, a projector that turns on. And, again, it's, it's, it's a box. Um, it's your class, you know, classic projector box with the rounded edges. And we see the shape a lot throughout the movie. And, um, they start flashing imagery and telling her, like, what she's supposed to say. Again, like, the void comp test. Which or, is yeah, no, or she's, yeah, they're, they're showing her flashes of sort of abstract images. Mm -hmm. Not, it's not a Rorschach test, but it's very similar. And she it's, has to say the first word that comes to her mind. And then they start asking her, it's like, we've generated a number zero through a hundred inclusive. What's the number? And, like, she guesses it. And then, like, after that... They're like, oh, you you get guess the number generator eight times, and she's like, yeah, but I also missed it eight times. Which still, in terms of and probability, very still good. very high. That's in insane, zero, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, in zero to a hundred, like guessing the exact number eight, like half fifty percent of the time, and so it's like, yeah, well, so it's like you're half psychic. That's better than than you know than nothing. And he's like, but I do like how he's like, we'll just like we'll just call it. Uh, you know, you're extremely intuitive, but it's like, that's why they, that's why they bring her on for this case. Mm -hmm. it, it sort of feels like a last ditch kind of effort because these long legs murders have been happening for 30 years since the sixties. Yeah. So, and they have like literally, the they have nothing. Well, it's like when the police go to a psychic. You know, yeah. Like it's it's at a point of desperation. Why not? Might as well. You know, can't hurt. <laughs> can't hurt. Exactly. And except when um, totally. <laughs> what I like, totally what I like here too about that, like a, like her half hunch thing, is it immediately like prepares us as the audience to accept that in this movie, the supernatural is going to occur 
in some capacity. Yes. Right? Like, we are already, like, existing in the bounds outside of what we would consider to be regular and normal. Which I, which I will say <clears throat> is a pretty huge misgiving that I had off the bat in this film and is one of the things that by the end I'm still not 100% sure how I feel about. Really, that's actually because, something I like. Because the, I the, the, yeah, trailer, I the trailer suggests nothing supernatural, right? Like, I was very... I, I did very much go into this primed for Silence of the Lambs style occult serial killer procedural. Sure, something like Silence of the Lambs or Seven. Or Seven, where, which is another big influence I, for I this, yeah. It, Especially with the, the religious really motivated. One of the really worked for me beyond uh, kind of the comparisons to Seven or Silence of the Lambs, both great movies, but different. Uh, yeah. In that, like... This movie, its approach to characters is very, still, uh, you know, off kilter and stilted yeah. and clinical. You think Fine. of characters like Brad Pitt in Seven What's or in Clarice, the box? and yeah. they're very human characters. You know, they feel like out of this world. You know, where Lee feels kind of foreign removed. in a way and removed yeah. and very, again, like. She is disassociated, almost disassociated, mm. and kind of uh, almost abrasive in ways, um, like a doll. I think, I think having that supernatural element kind of sets the expectation for what the audience is getting into early, rather than trying to connect super hard sure. on a human level in the same way. Well, yeah, and I, I think it. I think it is kind of. It, it does sort of become kind of necessary because, like, just like Micah Monroe is kind of uh, detached and dissociated, like you said, she's not. She's not relatable in the way that Clarice Starling yeah. is, and I think. And this is another sort of misgiving I have, but like you know, again, like coming around more on it, like the more I'm willing to let this movie be its own thing, is that like. Long legs, like Nick Cage, is not a human serial killer, like somebody like Buffalo Bill is. Monstrous nonetheless, but Buffalo Bill feels human. He feels humanly motivated, and that's kind of a reason why he's so scary i think in silence of the lambs is because there is there there's a point of relation with him there's a point of sympathy to a degree you know Which, and seeing yeah. that what he's capable of is where the horror comes from and really in this movie like long legs is like barely recognizable as human in just about any way like so over the top and like disconnected from reality and demonic right so like i do think that for the kind of killer they're trying to make him the presence of the supernatural is almost a necessity it's just not what i was expecting sure, so i'm sure. having to so i'm i'm coming to terms with that you know what i mean yeah, yeah definitely you know speaking of his portrayal is long legs. I I thought it was excellent. Yeah. I you know it has almost a r weird sense of humor to it. This whole movie does. That's another yeah. thing that I wanted to get into is that like there is an undercurrent of like pitch black comedy in this. Like it's certainly not overdone by any means, but there it's are a dry. Yeah. It's extremely dry, but there are a few parts where we all laughed, and I think you're supposed to laugh. Yeah. I I think. Part of what works so well about that is the, the tonal juxtaposition, yeah. right? Like, mm. you have this very almost satanic kind of intro, but you have a quote by the glam metal band T-Rex. From T-Rex, yeah. yeah. And the, like, the continued, pr again, the continued presence of T-Rex in this movie is bizarre. I, I loved it, honestly. Like I didn't dislike yeah. it, but it's strange. Yeah. 
I think it does really help balance the tone of the film because it is an incredibly bleak film, I'd say, entirely devoid of hope. And Especially by the ending. Yeah. It is entirely devoid of hope. And if and like if it didn't give you anything to laugh at, like I like it's already the atmosphere of this film is oppressive. Yeah. And what's yeah. cool too. It would be about almost comedy, be too much. It would almost it, it be never... overly self serious. Yeah. yeah. Which it isn't. The comedy for me like never like takes the film out of its own world too. Like no. it is a a pleasant distraction from the misery, but it's one that still very much fits in this drab early nineties environment, right? Like one of my one of my favorite examples is like they're following up a lead. It's one of the the girls who actually survived is in this mental institution. And before they talk the to only the girl, one. The only one. That's right. The sole survivor. Uh and before they talk to her, they talk to the head of the the institution. Um, yeah. the sanitarium or whatever it would be. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I love it because like he, the guy says like, yeah, this this person came through. They left their name. He slides the book over. It says Lee Harker, which is our, our protagonist's name. Yeah. And Lee looks at him. She says, oh, do you guys ID? Do you, Yeah. Do you check IDs do you, do you, for visitors? Yeah. Do you check IDs for visitors? Um, and, and he says... No, but you know that he's sounds like, like you a know good that, idea. He's like, you know that is that would be a good idea. Yeah, and he's kind I, of like a flamboyant. Like he's wearing like a pink suit. Yeah, he's and great. He's, and he's like, and, and he's it's like, like, you know, that would be a great idea. He's got like a and, gay <laughs> lisp. You know, he's like, he's like, you know, that is a good idea. But no, we like, don't. In, in terms of like like the the bureaucracy of an institution like that, I one thousand percent buy it. Like it's it's such a like a human response to that question and it's funny because and the it's fact so true that, and the fact that harker and carver don't like outwardly respond to it like, no they just get, move on it's yeah. like it's like they both take it just like kind of strafe it's like you get a little bit like because you know they have to hear that shit all day micah monroe's performance <laughs> in this i just say a little tangent fantastic like yeah stoic but also like so full of subtlety and like that's a great moment where it's like you see on her face it's like she's outwardly revealing nothing but there's like there's kind of like a movement of her eyes just like what like, yeah. you don't id yeah, people it's stoic, you know? but it's not static i i oh well said i i love how expressive yeah she gets especially later no. into the movie she like for as as stiff as her her character is made to be because of her circumstances she is still so sympathetic but you can yeah. tell that like Micah monroe like worked hard to get her character's walk down even um which you know is like like acting 101 you know get your character's walk right but it's shown off in in wonderful ways throughout this film and like even the way that she walks she carries herself is with this rigidity like there is just something on her back just mm -hmm. working its claws in um, yeah, just like really, really excellent. This this feels like a career defining performance for her. Yes. I, I and I hope it is because like she's she's great in ever like love her and it follows yeah. love her in the guest like she's fantastic. But it's like this this movie feels like a performance that says like I'm a I'm an actor. Yeah. You know, like she's incredible. Uh, not I, that that seems a little patronizing, but well, like no, it's I like there's because like, she's 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 significantly younger and it follows and and she's a uh, she's in the final girl role, you yeah. know, where she's she's the teen in distress and that does still take a great deal of work and effort. Um, uh, and, and her performance is in both it follows is fucking great in, in, in it, both of those. Things. It follows and the guest but still, this, yeah. Nuanced. Yeah, th this performance does like give her an opportunity to elevate her status, and she fucking nailed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. She um, yeah, she absolutely rises to the challenge, playing against type too. I think oh, yeah. because it's like again, in it follows and the guest. I know she's done a couple other movies, but in those she's like the young, pretty teen blonde yeah. that you know. She did that movie Watchers. Yeah, I never saw that. I heard it was it. good though. I've heard it's really good. I mean, I've heard it's uh, good. I mean, the the, the, not, the Shyamalan one, not the Watchers, <laughs> no, a different one. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I well, I think what's so interesting about it is the film is very subjective through her lens a lot of the time. Of yeah, you know? exclusively. Like uh, part of the reason the film is so off kilter is because you know, we're seeing things from her perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that adds a, a ton of flavor to her character where like it's stoic, but yeah. because we're seeing, you know, kind of her perspective on things, it, it becomes much more rich. Yeah. Yes. I want to touch on this both lightly now, uh, pre and post reveal to the plot. So pre reveal before we get to that, 
Um, I want to I want to just dissect the the opening sequence of the film. Yeah, um, love uh, this. Love so the, cold the film movie, starts yeah. out in four by four. Like um, it's a, just a, a clean four by three. Four by is it four? Yeah, I guess it would be four by three. But I, I no, it's it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's, a it's a square. Yeah, yeah it's okay. it's smaller than four by three because what it is all yeah, it, it's only one by one. Really. Throughout this movie, there are flashbacks, and they're all framed like uh, the square. like the like red square. Yeah, but like like a project like an like an yes. old fashioned projector with the a the slide rounded projector yeah slide one. projector yeah. with Which the is round one, edges. one by one yeah and. So, uh, oh, and also, like, I'm pretty sure, like, there are, like, some types of, like, 70s to 90s. Is there, like, a type of handheld that does things in, like, one by one or whatever? Super 8. Like, Shoots Super 8. Three. Three. Oh, oh, okay. Well, interesting. Anyway, it, it has that kind of quality to it. Um, but, uh, the, uh... It's a, sm- the the point is, it's a small frame. It's a any, smaller any than four by four. We, than four we by revisit three. her childhood. We're brought back to this box, right? This, this one by one, this square mm-hmm. that we're looking through. And it really forces us to narrow our focus and, and um, you know, see through, like, what sort of, essentially, especially in a movie theater, like, it feels like tunnel vision. And you're brought into these moments, which alone is a great way to, to emphasize tension. Mm-hmm. Um, for as many, like, really horrifying reveals as this movie has, it, in equal parts, has so many false reveals where they're just shots of woods and there isn't anything there that are equally terrifying because we're kind of forced to look at it through this tiny scope. And it, it allows us to hang on those things for a little bit longer and allow for processing in a neat way. So she's in her front yard. It's snowy. It's, it's all white and pretty outside and idyllic. And a station wagon rolls up, and um, she doesn't see anybody. And uh, she's, a, she's a young girl. Uh, and uh, this is kind of a spoiler that it's her in this opening sequence. Right, but we don't who else learn it. I mean,. It could be it could be any of any victims. of Longlegs victims' <laughs> families because he always targets. Yeah, I, I suppose yeah. so. I just families with little girls, I, I, yeah, like from the beginning. But I, I get that. Like that that is kind um, of a big reveal yeah, later in the I, movie okay. that that I, was my bad. Connect the dots right away. Oh, honestly. I yeah, I honestly like yeah from the like literally in the scene I just assumed. I'm sorry, I get this. That I don't know that, why. That I don't know why you would. He's a he's a killer. Why would you Why would you think that that like he's a serial killer? Like why would you think that those two characters have met each other at the very beginning of the film. Um, because we don't see the aftermath. So, like, I, I tend to assume, like, if we don't see the aftermath, then... Like... Well, yeah, but then a couple of scenes later, we get the whole rundown of his three decades of nefarious crimes. Mm-hmm. It's like, that yeah. That right, could have okay, that yeah. scene could have been any one of those. Yes, which which further sort of led me to, into it that, it that that felt too obvious. Like, that, it, of course, it would be one of those, so it isn't. And I was right. Anyway, to get to get back to my my original point, the yes, um, it's a she, good scene. It's it's a great scene. She she looks left, and then the shot exchanges, and she looks right, and then she looks forward again. And I and I love this because it it really they just they're just moving the camera you know ninety degrees for each shot, and then she looks forward and oh long legs is there, but we're seeing it from her like height level. So the top of Long Legs' head is cut off. We just see the, his mouth. Yeah. Um, which is uh, chilling. It, it, it's really spooky. And he speaks to her, and the camera does a hard 180. And this movie has some of the best uses of breaking the 180 I have seen in movies. Like, it's it's always jarring, and for reasons I'll touch on later, I, I think that there's a lot of really good use for why they do that. Um, sure. beyond it just being, like, it's unsettling, it kind of puts you off, but, again, when you have that one-by-one, one, like, square, it it allows, um, it's, it's sort of, also sort of baked into the necessity of it. It's really sick, but, um, yeah, and he, and he says, like, uh, I, I forget exactly. Like, yeah, I forget exactly what he says, but she, she's wearing a, a Polaroid camera around her neck, and she, like, when he appears, she, like, raises it to, like, take a picture of like him. A and uh and he says something to the effect of uh like oh you want to take my picture but i wore my long legs today um terrifying so Awful. but <laughs> but what if but if instead i do this or whatever and he like bends down and the camera flashes it's like the second his full face enters the frame it cuts yeah. hard cuts to to terrifying. uh to the the T the T Rex <laughs> lyrics. Well, I, I love that lyric uh, drop too because 
it's a very sort of almost gothic quote. Yes. And then it has T-Rex yeah. at the bottom as the quote. And it's such a funny juxtaposition. And it's yeah. so American, you know? Totally. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I love about that intro is I, I think it masterfully, like, introduces kind of these themes of the unsafeness of being a child. Yeah. And like, oh, it's, it's the milk carton era. Yeah, well, and <clears throat> and we have that great quote from the mother later where, you know, she's talking about kind of the privilege of being able being allowed al- to grow yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. Which and, takes on a totally different context yeah, later in the film, 100%. but but uh yeah. In that way, you know, between that and kind of the uh very evocative cinematography of that opening scene that kind of plays into the aesthetics of, like, earlier type of home video. Yeah. It reminded me in some ways of Skinnamarink. Hmm. Um, That's in kind of the approach to yeah. childhood and, like, mm-hmm. subjective seeing, approaches. Yeah, right. seeing I, the world through a child's eyes. Yeah, yeah 100%. Like, and, and there's so many, like, other films that, that capture, like, the that are that I, I would i would use the word pastiche for that that capture these themes often usually it's like late 80s stuff with satanic panic and milk carton stuff but we gotta remember that like again like things are just suddenly shift when you enter a new decade yeah right like the the early 90s where this is set like so many of those things throughout our childhoods as well like we're we're still quite pervasive and continue to be like up through our teens sure and um uh, that's another thing I appreciate about this film is that it is like it's it's early '90s. It's not late '80s. Um, because uh, that's that's my childhood, yeah. baby. Well, and, and like, <laughs> and yet again, hard to not make the Silence of the Lambs comparison, which came out in '91. It's like this is set in the yes, early '90s. Much, so. The other yeah. obvious poll is Twin Peaks. Is Twin Peaks? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? Also '90s. Um, but you know, the, so many of those films, not the those are great films, but like so many other movies that you know, like just really pull it pastiche will talk about these things. They'll be like, oh, the milk cartons, you know? Like, yeah. oh, and they'll, sh- they'll have to show you them fucking milk cartons and roll them out and everything else. And here, this film touches on the themes and those those equal themes without ever showing you a fucking milk carton with a kid missing, right? Like, we never have to actually look at a fucking uh, 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 newscast about satanic panic or whatever. Oh, uh, Maxine, I'm talking about you. Like, <laughs> it, it, in, in this movie, like, this, this, frankly, again, coming out of Maxine, this is what I wanted. Right? Yeah. Like this is this is exactly what I was talking about, and I feel even more validated. Well, this, it's nice to have a week to week. This is of that. the the thing about this movie too is that it's set in the early '90s, but it's paced like a I, I would say like a '70s film. Yeah. I think it has a Quite. lot. I think it has a lot of the sensibilities of kind of like the the late 70s like indie boom where it's kind of like a, a weirdo like outsider film that's a really slow burn but has uh really fucked up vibes and what's cool about that too is that that helps play into the period for me because and i've talked about this before but what i really love about a good period piece is when they recognize that like things from that period often see carryover from the previous eras and like a lot of that like wood paneling and beige and everything else like also carries through from the 70s so like the visual like uh style is informed by that also um i think she's what like 20 in the early 90s as an fbi agent and uh so when she was a kid she was growing up in like the late 70s early 80s and so like a lot of the scenes of her in her childhood are that time so it, it kind of the, the two yeah. gets to sort of flow into each other and inform that. Yeah, her. In a nice if they way. say her her encounter with with Long Light that we see at the very beginning was in like seventy five or something like that. Near you her know, ninth birthday. In, yeah. Any other film, I would almost resent how the movie directly informs this of us because it's a trope. It's it's in so many like terrible works that try to do the same thing. But here it, it does operate in, within the, 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 the confines of the theme, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to kind of let it pass. But they just really loudly show uh, uh, throughout the film whatever active president is there at the time. Obviously, they're in the FBI like yeah, that, headquarters, dude, that's, so there'd be a big, of course, there'd be a big law. Claim. That's what law enforcement buildings are like. Of they course. have huge pi- pictures so, of 
they the do. fucking sitting president. Like, and and like it, it, it's believable, but also like it's it, in many movies, it's it's an it's a great way to say, hey, we're exactly this era. Like, yeah. Um, and it, it is a trope that's very often Bill played Clinton up to, is to, to Bill comedy. Clinton is constantly like, looming like, uh, over. over people. Well, that's the thing is like it's played up as a theme. It's like this like it's these like powerful men, you know, like staring down over us because they do it again later, like when they flash back to, um, like when they, they they flash back there's a shot there's a big one of nixon in the background too yeah um uh i think it's it's the if i remember correctly it's the when we actually see the the father murder the family is it that one anyway yeah. but it's like okay cool okay he's the father of the nation it's a you know i, I get what they're doing there and I, i'm willing to let it slide and it, it's done well but you know again in it, it, it is it is a thing that's done a lot but here it's fun i think um I mean, it makes sense for the the location too. Like, yeah, like what you said. Yeah. Uh, I I think the the production design is pretty incredible in this film. One of my oh, favorite yeah. examples of it is uh, after Lee is assigned to the Long Legs case, um, they go out to uh, one of the houses of the victims, and this is introduced as like it's a long shot. Um, of the house and them looking through their window at the house mm-hmm. far away. And what I love is it's super subtle, but the houses are all white in a row, very suburban. But the house that they're focusing on is like a bluish tint of white. It's very subtle, but it's almost <coughs> as, as though the warmth of the house has disappeared. And, you know, it brings your focus in on the house in such a subtle way. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's just a great example of, All like, the, life the masterful, the from it. like, control over color. The, c- the cinematography is exquisite. I did want to take the chance to shout out the 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 cinematographer of this movie. is a dude uh, named Andres Orochi. Um, and why I want to particularly shout him out <laughs> is because... Fun. This is his first feature film. Get the fuck oh, out wow. of here. His looking at his credits, wow. he's Impressive. he's done, he's DP'd like 10 other shorts and music videos in the last 10 years since 2014 that he's credited as the cinematographer. This is his very first feature and it's one of the best looking films I've seen this year for sure but also just like in general maybe in general yeah, it's yeah. incredible it's it looks so and, good it's like the way it plays into the and Oz, i think oz perkins like always works with good dps he always has like a great visual sense like the black coat's daughter is is a very uh subtly aesthetic movie and in, in so many ways that i really really love uh and this feels like perfectly in line with that but just like man absolutely incredible looking film and i will say considering the setting and sort of like the period sensibilities this movie is like very clearly shot on digital it is not shot Mm -hmm. on film which normally i you know i think i might you know like skew towards preferring shooting on film but there's something about like how crisp this yeah. movie is that I just find like incredibly immersive that no, like it's really appealing that like if it was if there was like film grain especially if there was like artificial film grain no. it would I don't know there's yeah, like skin and it would we, almost we, feel we too about, cinematic we, yeah we okay, talk a lot about how film has kind of like authentically shooting on film kind of gives a film warmth in terms of like yeah. the actual yeah. you know tangibility oh, yeah. of it that's, and i think yeah. it also goes the opposite direction you know because you shoot on digital it brings a coldness yes. to it no well um, very well said no that you nailed it that's 100% what it is yeah. and it's it's what this film needs especially considering that like in terms of its color palette it's very warm mm-hmm. it's lots of browns and oranges but totally. and beiges yeah. but yeah there is there's a there's a coldness to it. There's a very sharp clinical coldness to it that I think 
makes it more immersive in kind of like a spooky way. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And again, as, as a kid, uh, I think we can all agree, like, we, we found ourselves, like, these are the kinds of spaces that we grew up in. Yeah. You know, like like old office buildings or whatever else. You have to go there because your, your mom is at an appointment or whatever, or you have to help someone clean up yeah. at the end of their shift. So, like, you're, you just find yourself in these old beige brown places with the lights off. And it, and again, like it's, it's such a specific part of at least again, like my childhood in the nineties that I just, I don't see often nailed in period. Yeah. And I, I, I hope we see more of it. It's uh, period, but... it's period without being like in your face period. Right. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like it's not drawing, Which is often, frankly, the best period. It's not drawing attention to itself as a period piece. Yeah. Um, well, because it was again, like, like at a certain point, like that's where it just becomes pastiche, right? Yeah. Like, that's where it becomes a gimmick. Like, it's like, oh, you love 80s stuff. Oh, it's 80s. It's like, well, no. That's where it becomes Maxine. Yeah. Like, instead, like... <laughs> also oh, a great-looking definitive... film. I'll be clear. Maxine does look great. Oh, Maxine great looks film. incredible. Like, uh, but... Um, and it's going for something different as well. Like, yeah. In full, full fairness in that respect. Like, again, re- Un- really... Unfair to compare, Really, though. my... Yeah, the, the, the place where I will negatively compare Maxine is very specifically in terms of the script. Like... Yeah. Um, uh, and the pacing. Yes, and the pacing. Um, but, like, uh, yeah, again, like, Maxine, like, has to, like, show you the fucking satanic panic newscast. Yeah, this movie is and so like much better the, paced. Yeah, and, and again, like, it's it's just, it's written with, you know, more more uh, care, I, yeah. I think. And, um, because uh, I didn't, like, like I, I didn't want to use the word subtlety, because Maxine obviously doesn't, isn't going for that. Yeah, but, it's painting. But it is care. Long like, legs, yeah, long legs is painting with a more, with a, a more subtle brush. But also, like, they are so different. Like, yeah, outside yeah. of recency bias, I do think it's kind of unfair to compare them. Very different films with very different yeah. goals. But, but again, like, but just, we did, I, in, we in did just of, see Maxine last In terms week. of, like, pastiche versus fucking, yeah. like, just yeah. period. Well, in terms of, like, comparison, you know, I I, I get that in terms of recency. And, like, I, I see, you know, in terms of American film, the Silence of the Lambs stuff. But I think the closest comparison, film-wise, to me, would be, like, Kiyoshi Kurosawa stuff. Like, Cure. Yeah, Cure, particularly. And... Which I don't want to talk about too much because Cleveland hasn't seen Cure. Thank you. But yeah, no, you're right. Like tonally, they're very similar, and also thematically too. Yes. Um, <laughs> in, in, in a couple of very specific ways. But I think that's especially so in the first half of mm-hmm. this film. In the second half, I think this movie kind of goes into its own territory. It goes into its own territory, but I do think it it goes into very familiar territory for Oz Perkins. Sure. I think it, yeah. I think it, yeah. I think in the second, in the second half, particularly, it very much becomes like a Oz Perkins TM film. Um, and that, that's not a complaint by any means, but yeah. it's like, that's, that's definitely where we get into, I think a lot of the black coats daughter, uh, comparisons for me when it gets like very satanic. Yeah. Well, and I, I suppose you could you could draw a direct connection with the Kieran Shipka uh, yeah. character. That's that's um, true, yeah. She does show up, which is nice. She's very good in this film. I do want to talk about kind of the the narrative structure of this film. This movie is divided into three chapters, mm-hmm. which is, I think is an interesting choice. I don't mind it. Yeah, I mean, they pretty much align with each of the three acts. The Black Coat's Daughter does the same thing. Yeah. It's also Usually divided I'm kind of hit chapters. or miss when movies do, like, chapters. Chapter headings, like, yeah. You really have to do it in a motivated way <clears throat> that feels like it makes sense to do. Otherwise, you're just, you know, pinning it on. But what what I love about the narrative structure of this film is, you know, there's the mystery element of Lee Harker kind of unraveling everything that's going on with the long legs case but it constantly feels like long legs is a step ahead of her yeah at every given moment well i mean yeah he's 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 literally guiding her from the beginning like he's he's the puppet master Mm -hmm. i mean yeah the 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 thing that like really puts movement into the case is like he straight up gives her a cipher like shows up at her house she goes outside well she sees him standing in the woods 
she goes outside with her gun, like, oh, what the fuck? And then she turns around and sees somebody inside, and she goes in, there's nobody there, but sitting on her desk where she was is uh, an, an envelope with her name on it, and she opens it up, and it's a birthday card for someone's ninth birthday, and on the inside it has... Uh, it has a, a cipher for her, basically. It's uh, it's like the the first line from whatever verse of Revelation that is. Like I stood upon the shore of the sea, and has it written in you know regular English, and then in the the Zodiac Killer, <laughs> the the, the Zodiac Code. Yeah, the the Wingdings. Yeah, <laughs> fuck off. Has it has it written in Wingdings? So with that, she's able to do what the FBI has not been able to do for all of these years with all of his letters. And she's able to crack the code Yes, yeah, because he gives it to her. And on the back of the card, he writes in the code, which she decodes with her cipher. Like if you tell anybody how you figured this out or how you got this, okay, how does he put it? It's, uh, it's really fucked. I'll cut your mother's milky tits. Yeah. He'll, oh. he'll cut, chop off your, I'll chop off her milk tits. I'll bleed your mother dry. Ugh, yeah. It's, it's chilling and yeah. vile. Uh, and so she has to go in and it's like when, when her boss asks her, like, cause she, they go to another crime scene and there's a letter and she just like whips it out and just like immediately decodes it. And he's like, how'd you do that? It's like, like you said, sir, I just looked at it long enough. It's like, she doesn't tell him. It's like, no, the killer broke into my house and gave me the, the key to, to, to the code. But yeah, like he's, he's leading her the entire time. Like mm-hmm. even when they finally catch him. Because he lets them, he wants them to. Yeah. He wants. Well, it's all part of the plan. I, I love that structure in the film because it kind of instills a sense. He's of, like the Joker. Well, it instills a sense of dread <laughs> in the audience, no. right? Because like, <laughs> even though we're uncovering more and more, yeah, it feels like we're hopeless in terms of things kind of being fated to happen. Well, yeah, everything, every bit of progress that the protagonists make in this movie is because they're allowed to make this progress. It's just like with her mom saying, it's like you were, you were allowed to grow up. Like everything that is happening is because long legs is allowing it. Um, which again is the, he's, he's the puppet master. He's literally the puppeteer. What did y'all think about that aspect of the movie? Let's get into uh, the, I think the, it's probably the one that the dolls, that, that, the puppets, uh, the real dolls creeped me yeah. out the most. Um, dolls are creepy. Yeah. Puppets dolls are, creepy. are very creepy. Yeah, in in a in a medium uh, overburdened with creepy dolls. Yeah, they they really fucking nailed it. I well, they're uh, used in such they're used in such an interesting way in this movie. Yeah. yeah. As like literally the conduit for the supernatural, the 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 conduit for long legs, ma- yeah. The conduit for long legs magic, it's so creepy. which is again something that I was not going into this movie expecting him casting satanic spells through dolls, but here we are. It's awesome. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's I must say. Rad. And well, you know, like frankly too, like it's it's what I was hoping. Like when they started doing the occult stuff. Like any any time a film has occult stuff affiliated with it, my hope is, man, I hope it, I hope the shit's real, right? It's interesting. In I, case, I'm usually the other. I'm usually the you other want way to be, around. Yeah, dry and un, well. I, 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 I love I love the occult aesthetic. Like I'm obviously very into it and tied into my own aesthetic a lot. But it's sure. like I don't believe in any of it. Like well, it's no. all it's all aesthetic and like yeah, that's it's the fun. It's the play of it. Like it's the fantasy of it. <laughs> um, uh, you know what I think? Like maybe maybe let's meet in the middle. I think uh, my it I'm. I like it the most when it's ambiguous, when we don't know yeah. if it is real or not. That's probably what gets my jollies the most jolly. Totally. Like, I, I, it's when, uh, where there is uh, some uncertainty whether or not the, you know, Cthulhu is actually rising up out of the water or if it's well, just what they're... Well, okay, here we, here we go. That's, that's what I, that's what I love about the Black Coat's Daughter. Agreed. It's one of my favorite things about the Black Coat's Daughter. Yes. I've, I've revisited that movie a few times since we recorded our episode and even pretty recently and the 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 constant ambiguity over whether satan is real vision. or just totally a fabrication of her unstable mind and the fact that even at the very final shot of the film we don't know one way or the other 
whether that answer and, is true. It's like either he never, answer bad. <laughs> either yeah, one scary. terrifying. It's, yeah, scary yeah. in its own in its own implications. And it's like that's what I really loved, and that's something that I came out of this movie again having some kind of misgivings on yes. where. Oz Perkins in this movie is like, it's the same thing where there's like satanically motivated killings, but it's basically like, nah, man, this shit is fucking real. Like Satan is about this shit and he is giving long legs fucking magic power. <laughs> See, what I, what I liked about it's it. It's like Satan is real and he wants souls. <laughs> I, I actually preferred the lack of ambiguity in this film mm. because I think the the way they they go about it makes it feel all the more hopeless. Well, yes, it's it's it makes it does make the film more bleak, especially by the ending, because it's like it's like man, there's no ambiguity here. It's like again, like Satan is real and he wants souls, and he won. Satan won. To it, Ben. Let's go ahead and get into the spoiler. Right? Are we ready? I mean, like, let's just go ahead and break. Like we already kind of have sure. because because I I have misgivings, but you first. Sure. They they find a pattern that uh, within six days of a child's birthday, you know, Long Legs comes. Every single family he targets has a young daughter around nine, ten years old whose birthday is on the 14th of the month. Mm -hmm. And the killings always happen either six days before the, the birthday... Yeah, or six days after. Um, and Lee figures this out by writing out the dates, and then she traces it and sees that this algorithm, as she calls it, creates an inverted triangle. Yeah. Well, the she six, has that six, book six, the, yeah. The, the, the nine circles of hell. Which, yeah. Awesome book. Cool, yeah. yeah. But uh, I, I love how that plays into the theme of kind of wholesome... Americana and the kind of the the sinister stuff that lies under the surface. Very Twin Peaks. Yeah. Um, the inversion of it too. Like it's it's, yeah. you know, it's always about like the inverted symbols. It's it's the 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 inverse of the pure of the good. The sacred being made profane. Right. Yeah. Oh, these, these, these horrible these horrible murders happening mm -hmm. around the birthday of a young girl. Yeah, one like, of those that's something that's supposed to be in this joyous time. and happy, and it's like and is like within that period of time there is. Yeah, horror. and so uh, you know, as things develop and are uncovered, um, you know, we get bits and pieces of lee's relationship with her mom mm -hmm. you know she even goes to visit her at one point and it's revealed that she's like a hoarder yeah her house is terribly cluttered oh yeah um really it's... really great production design yeah. on the house um her mother has kept everything from her childhood yeah but uh she seems kind of like vaguely like mentally ill too like mm -hmm. kind of scattered like they never put a name on it but it's like in the way like you would see a hoarder yeah it's like yeah. she's she doesn't yeah she doesn't Very seem believable she doesn't seem well yeah. she always she's always asking her like if she said her prayers yeah i really like that scene where she goes to visit her because she says she asked her that on the phone earlier and lee's like yes mom i'm saying my prayers and then she goes to visit her later it's the same conversation she says where she was like allowed to grow up she's like i want you to answer me honestly like are you saying your prayers and lee's like no never once my prayers scare me and she's oddly and she for laughs she's forgiving yeah, yeah. She, she, laughs, she laughs and she's like and she's like oh, yeah no, you know what no. you're right our prayers don't protect us from anything yeah, yeah. I, I horrifying yeah, without yeah. Just the context horrifying yeah i didn't see it as forgiving i saw it as very yeah. creepy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I guess like um, uncannily accepting. Sure, right? yeah. Like, yeah like accepting you would, of you would, yeah. you would expect like any mother because again like just her phone conversation when the mother's like, "Have you said your prayers?" All this stuff. It paints an image of who the mother is supposed to be, and then we go and see the mother, and it ain't that chief. Like it's a very different thing, and it, it's not like it's it's not like the the conservative like Christian mother figure that is always portrayed in these types of movies even like the overbearing one it's off-putting and, and that, that's really that's really fascinating to me um that they took like a a something that is often villainized in movies is this like christian overbearing mother and they made her not that and that's even more unsettling that's cool that's, yeah, that's they a turned, neat, they that's a cool her, mechanism 
They made her a different kind of monster. Yeah, yeah. And I agree. I really respect it. She realizes there's a sort of connection between the date of her ninth birthday and, uh, you know, the card she gets. And, yeah. like, trying to figure... Piece her together. birthday is on the 14th yeah. of January. Trying to yeah. piece together things. So she goes to visit her mom, and she questions her about her ninth birthday. And the mom goes cold on it and kind of uh, retracts, you know, from, yeah. from well, that question. Well, her, her boss tells her, it's like, did you... It's like, because her boss is like, we haven't made any movement on this case in years, but as soon as we bring you on, it starts flowing like lava. It's like, did you know that, like, on the day before your ninth birthday, on the 13th, your mom called in a, a police report about a trespasser on your property, like a tall, pale man. And Lee's like, no, I don't know anything. I was like, okay, well, go talk to, go talk to your mom. Um, and she gets like a, her mom's like, I, you know, I kept everything, like all your stuff's in your room. So go look around if you want. And she finds like her old Polaroids or all photographs. And she finds the photo that she took of long legs. Like that's when we realize it's like, oh yeah, that, what we saw at the beginning of the movie, that cold open, was her. Yeah, and they they quickly capture Long Light. Yeah, like immediately. Yeah. Just with that one photograph, uh, they just like immediately well, get it. Considering photograph. how he looks, you know, we we didn't really touch on it, but uh, Nick Cage is in very distinctive kind Uncanny. of uh, kind of facial prosthetics. Um, he he looks a... like a Bogdanoff brother. He looks like Steve Bannon. He's like pale and like bloated. Yeah, like he's and... been in the microwave for too long. Yeah, there's a yeah. There's really a... he looks bad. There's yeah. a believable uncanniness to it that makes him feel like a doll in the way you would look at a very real person and say, "Damn, they feel kind of like a doll." And I I think that's neat. And I think that's really hard to do. Yeah, it's um, great. Like because it. His makeup looks, again, both very believably real, like an entirely different real person, and also uncanny. Yeah, totally uncanny. But, but in ways, I nobody, buy. no real person looks like that. Real people, do except for people, except, except for, for people who have had like extensive yeah. plastic surgery. Plastic surgery disaster. And yeah. what I, what I love about Nick Cage's performance is it's a very Nick Cage performance in very, a lot of ways. But, very. You know, you look at him. And it doesn't necessarily read as Nick Cage because it's uh-uh. such a distinctive look. I am so he gets lost in this grateful role, yeah. for yeah. this makeup because uh, uh, you know again, yeah, his his voice is very much Nick Cage. His performance is very in line with other unhinged Nick Cage roles. Um, he he's, he does bring something unique to this one, but even still, he does a lot of like interrupted pacing and crazy bits that are just so like nick cage coded but because he looks it's a performance that only nick cage can do but at the same time like he does still like all of nick cage's best performances like he does get lost in it yeah a big reason i'm grateful for this movie is i one of the one of the most frustrating trends of the last few years for me (laughs) say the last 10 years is the sort of memification of Nick Cage. Yeah. Like, obviously, we all love Nick Cage. He's done so many performances that are, that are ideal for meme formats, but and they it's, did the movie it's, caught, it's, it's caught up with itself, and it's become an Ouroboros. It's eating its own fucking tail. I never saw that that movie, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I've heard from a lot of people that it's good. Sure. Whatever, it's, but it's like... Little overly self-referential yeah the the premise just bugs me it's just like all of these movies doing like nick cage is like gag casting yeah and it's like that shit frustrates me because he does have a lot of like funny over-the-top performances and he's a funny character but he's a very serious actor and he takes his craft very seriously and all of the decisions that he makes are extremely deliberate and I think every now and then a movie like this or like Mandy will come along and remind people that he's a real fucking actor. Porter called New Orleans, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 100%. Well, I mean, I think ultimately it comes down to the quality of the director. You know, 100%. A yeah. lot of times there's two different kinds of Nick Cage that you can get. You can get a. Both of them are good. You know, we get good performance. Both of them are entertaining, them. at least. But yeah. Uh, yeah. you get either a Nick Cage performance. 
or a performance of a character. And what I love about this movie is we don't get a Nick Cage performance as much as we get a Long Legs performance yeah. by Nick Cage. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. you know, like, that's the thing about, like, any great method actor is they are, like, quality putty in the hands of a Of, a, g- of a good director. Yeah, yeah, in this case, Oz Perkins, like, sculpted. And I think beautiful. part of the reason why Nick Cage became such a meme is because he went through that period in the 2000s. Yeah, where, where he, he owed was, a lot of money. And so where he, he was, anything. like, bankrupt, so he was just taking, yeah. like, any fucking I, I literally fucking worked movie. on one of those movies. That's true. <laughs> your, your, your art shares... Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in, like, yeah, my, my work is in USS Indianapolis. This, shares like, the screen I, with Nick Cage in the USS Indianapolis uh, That was my movie. first film gig. Like, yeah, I worked on a Nick Cage movie. I've yeah. talk, I think I've talked about it but before. But it's like, but... yeah, he's... I, so it's like he did so many of these these performances in just, like, absolutely god-awful fucking films yeah, yeah. and Ghost Rider and shit. And it's like, hey, yeah, that... Hey, hey. <laughs> Careful. You too? Yeah, you could. Yeah. Good, I have an ally. The second one was directed by uh, the Craig guys. Neville Dean Tilly. Yeah, I know. The movies, they're not good. They're bad. They're bad movies. I'm sorry. They're bad movies, uh, but they're fun. They're, 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 but they're they're bad movies in kind of fun ways. Yeah. Um, whatever. But yeah, my point is like, Nick Cage is, I, I do think, is one of our great living actors. Yes. And when the only types of movies that people associate him with are things like Renfield and the unbearable weight of massive talent. I think it does a disservice to the greatness of Nick Cage. Yeah. Yeah. It it doesn't help when, you know, like again, he's, he's still, he's still, he's also, he's also on record as, as hating, uh, his meme status. Yeah. So I feel I do feel kind of bad oh, yeah. for him. I mean, yeah, who wouldn't? Um, but you know, he he's kind of took it in stride. Yeah, you know, he wouldn't sure. do. You know, he wouldn't do unbearable, unbearable weight of massive talent if he didn't if take it in stride. Um, yeah. Or, or but, Willie's Wonderland or whatever. Sure, you know. But I will say, like, what is so great about this performance is it's horrifying. And again, with all the prosthetics, he falls into the role. A hundred percent. One of my favorite scenes is when uh, they're playing the video recording of his questioning. Yeah. In uh, the FBI headquarters, and uh, it's on this sort of CRT TV. It's great. And uh, he's almost directly talking to the characters in the room, mm-hmm. even though th- he's not in the room. Again, the, the CRT. Well, because he knows that oh, Lee is going to be really watching that tape, yeah. so he's really talking to, to her, her because he yeah. knows but they're going to be showing it but to he her later. Directly, yeah. like points his head towards characters in the room in a way that is chilling, yeah, and kind of uh, very uniquely horrifying. I like that. That just me. I like that, that just ends with him like singing "Happy Birthday" to Lee, and one of the FBI agents just pauses it, and they're like, "He goes on like that for another twenty four minutes," and it's just like, but then <laughs> after that, was but then after him. that, they just leave it paused, and like Lee is like talking to uh to like Carter with just this horrible freeze frame of long legs, like mid something between crying and weeping and cackling just like looming over well, Carver's over he's Carter's looming shoulder over her the same way that like Clinton is looming over us in the, the of, other yeah. scenes in the movie and that's what i mean like like a again, different like, kind of sex so pervert. well it's like yeah it's like these these like fucking weird men are like always looming over us in this yeah. film puppeting us whether it's Clinton or Nixon or long legs, like they, they do this throughout the film. And again, they never say it, they never touch on it, but it's always there. Yeah. It, it, oh, it's great. Well, I like, I like the way they end that scene Cause, too. Cause you, like, like, no, like, yes, I, I wanted to say this earlier, but like, 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 yes. And the FBI institution, like, of course, like these government buildings, they always have like portraits of the president up there, but that Bill Clinton one is like eight feet tall. It's huge. <laughs> like it's massive. Like, and, it, and it's, it's not it's, a, it's, it's, it's not eight no, feet but it, tall. But it, but it's big <laughs> um, and it looms over the scene for a reason. Yes. And it's done by design. It's not just to remind us that we're in the nineties. Like it's, it, there's, there's real intent and purpose there. But anyway, carry on. Um, I, I like the way that scene ends too, because that's right before she goes to interrogate him herself. And she's like, where is he? And Carter's like, he's right below your feet. He's downstairs. He's downstairs. He's downstairs. Yeah. And it's like the we you know, we've we've continually <laughs> heard 
about like the man downstairs, Mr. A friend of a friend. A friend of a friend. friend. It's basically uh, long legs is euphemism for Satan is the mm. is the man downstairs. Well, because like you know, in, Mr. In, Mr. Downstairs in religion, like you know, folks Down... always are like you know, I got to run it by the man upstairs, and they mean God, right? right? Because it's like, oh, we're we're you know, I got I got to talk to the guy upstairs about this. I got to I got to talk to God. I got to get my shit. He's right. like, yeah, I'm a friend of a friend, yeah. and they're like, of who? Of the man downstairs. Well, downstairs from where? Downstairs from everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and so, she, and so she goes downstairs. She descends into hell to have her her one and only con. Well, except for when she was a little girl, her one and only confrontation with long legs. Yeah. Well, uh, important to mention, like long legs. Kills himself in front of. Oh her. yeah! At the uh, end of that and interrogation, that's yeah. that's how the he he mugs well, he mugs the camera and gives a classic hail Satan and then slams his yeah. face that, listen, he, into he makes, the he into makes, the like, table he until makes he dies. The man downstairs explicitly Satan. He says hail Satan. hail Satan, and in a way only Nick Cage could do. And then yeah, he just bashes his head. Which here's the thing, right? Again, to much like the Clinton portraits or whatever, like. A monster or a possessed person slamming their head into something until their head is putty is... It, it permeates horror. Like, it's a trope we've seen a million times. Smile does this kind of thing. Yeah, and sure. It's in the trailer for Smile too, And, like, there's so... Like, and, and so many movies before that, like, the person just hitting their head against the thing until finally they're, they're dead um, has been done. But here, it's done really fucking well i gotta say like yeah i, I don't mind it like um uh the gore looks great like it's gruesome, and, it, and it's yeah. excellent too because he like caves in his skull he caves much. in his skull his his nose is gone he's just gone by the end, by the end yeah. and i love it because like he he does it he does it he does it and then he he lifts his head and there's just it's 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 just it's almost skeletal like his nose is missing his face is so horrifying and fucked up. And again, too impressive that, like, they make it look like his weird fucking prosthetic face has been damaged. Yeah. It's not Nick Cage beneath that. Like, it really, really impressive makeup work. And then we think it's over. He's upright in the chair. And then he slams his head one last time. And, and he's and dead. Blood just pours out from every, like, hole of which there are many in his face yeah like across the table and all over the rest of it chilling well Great it's like stuff. and there's still and there's still like a third of the movie to go at this point you know and yeah. he kind of says like before he dies is like he you know she says it's like after all of this like it's over for you like you're done and he's like yes i'm done but it's not over and after this i'll be he says something like there will be little a little bit of me everywhere you know, and so they they sort of like hinted before this, but it becomes a big thing. It's like he must he there's no way he could have been doing this all these years by himself. He must have an accomplice, yeah. um, which, you know, I kind of like because like they again, they reference the book of Revelation with the the great beast rising out of the sea with the seven heads and ten crowns and so on and so forth. Again, the 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 teeth of the Hydra. Uh, has the beast has many heads, and long legs is just one of the heads. Um, so the the final act of the film is figuring out who is the accomplice and what is the ultimate culmination here of long legs plan she returns to her mother's house shortly after that yeah they got to bring um, they they're going to bring her in for questioning to see if she can help them find who out who the accomplice is yeah. uh she's accompanied by one of the other field agents and she goes inside to kind of uh confront her mom to figure out what actually uh happened you know on yeah. her ninth birthday and she goes inside and her mom's not there and we get a really great bit of foreshadowing when she first went to the the mom's house where she saw a locked door the door, the door to the, this was super on the nose. I, I mean, I think it's pretty hard to it's not. It's kind of fun, though. I think it's pretty hard to not clock the twist here because, yeah. 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 In, an early, in the earlier scene when she goes to visit her mom, she's in the kitchen making her mom some food. And she looks over at the, the doorway to the basement and a cockroach crawls out Which from under it's it. It's also like there are so many shots throughout the film, again, just to, to gush about the cinematography for a second. That are always, if if we're not literally looking through the film, like or, or look, looking at the film boxed, 
where the the environment itself boxes us in. We're yeah. looking at scenes through doorways, through windows, always in a way that perfectly frames everything. Like it's this whole movie is squares and rectangles to the to the point where like it informs the the occult symbolism as well. And again, I've never been like I, I was saying this to some, some some friends last night. Like I've never been like so spooked out by squares and rectangles before. Like like just the idea of boxes is like so fucking spooky yeah. in this movie. Yeah. It's great. And so like yeah, he is he's he's on the other side of that door. Yeah. He yeah. always Well, is. we've seen I, it we've seen a few times like the little bits and glimpses of him that we get before this. He's like obviously in a basement. Like it's very obviously yeah. a basement, which again Sounds of the Lambs esque, but so like when she looks at the basement door and there's a cockroach that crawls out from under it, and she has like these flashes of vision that she has of like a nest of writhing snakes that we see. It's a very cool image, but it's like when you see that, it's like okay, so Long Legs is in the basement, right? I, <laughs> like it's yeah. not like I it's mean, not I mean, subtle. I almost read like uh, in a similar way to the movie Prisoners. Where, like... Oh, yeah, sure. They have a reveal where, in hindsight, feels obvious. obvious. But it's... It almost feels like such a misdirect that it works. But in this movie, it's not in hindsight that it feels obvious. It's it feels foresight. obvious in the moment. Like, when I saw... The second she turned and looked at that basement door, I'm like, long legs down there. Immediately. Yeah. And yeah. that the reveal that her mother is the accomplice doesn't come for, like, another 20, see, 30 minutes. See, to me... That almost felt like it was so obvious that it that there's no way it could be have been that. Yeah, but, but like, yeah. what else could it yeah. be? Yeah, and like a cockroach in a hoarder house. Like. Yeah, well, the cockroach. Yeah, but with all the, the with all the talk of the man downstairs sure. and like we've sure. seen long legs in a basement somewhere. So when she looks at the basement door and has a vision of a nest of snakes, it's like. Okay, duh, he's down there. Of course he's down there. So yes, her mother is the accomplice, and we get in flashback with the mother's narration the true accounting of what happened on her ninth birthday. Long legs broke into the house, tied the mother up, was going to kill them, but the mother made a bargain. If you'll spare me and my daughter, I will... Uh, do your bidding. I will do your bidding. And It's worth saying, too, that this is all framed... First off, we see all of it in full. Yes. Um, again, in the that that square, the project. Uh, yeah, the, the yeah the projector it frame. Is, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I just you can finish, but like I, I I I'm going to start. I'm gonna frame with praise, and that it is done as a chilling, almost children bedtime story. It's a bedtime story. Well, sh we even see the mother like holding Lee in bed as she's telling the story. Yeah. So, and then she explains Longleg's whole method. We mentioned the dolls we didn't talk about. They find one of the dolls in the old farm of... A very lifelike yeah, porcelain doll. Yeah, it's incredible. Of Kiernan, where but Kiernan with real human got, hair, yeah, it's so fucked up. Real a very lifelike porcelain doll that looked just like her as a little girl. And a, a sort of metallic sphere. Inside the head of the doll, there's a mysterious metallic sphere that's hollow. It has nothing inside it, but when they put, like, some kind of machinery up to it, like, it whines. It's like it, it shrieks or whatever, it makes a sound. Here. And the 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 <laughs> the doctor who was doing it is yeah. like, when I was listening to it last night, I could have sworn it was whispering my ex wife's name to me, but I was tired, so I guess it didn't. So yes, we learned that through all of this, the mother was taking long legs as a puppet maker. He makes these these lifelike dolls of the little girls of the family, and Lee's mother dresses up as a nun and shows up at the door with this big box like you've won a, you're a winner you're a gift from the church and they open it up and it's the doll and through the sphere in the doll's head satan's evil magic makes the father of the family butcher everybody and then it kill sort himself of hypnotizes the whole hypnotizes them Hypnotized the whole family into a trance, and yeah, then the father kills the whole family and his uh, and himself. I do like what we see a few times, like the image of like these dolls, like covered in a black veil, but you can yeah, see, you can oh. just barely so see, yeah. you can just barely see the white eyes underneath the veil. Again, much um, much like the imagery in uh, Black Coat's daughter. Yeah. And well, and at this point too, it's like when we're learning is like, yeah, this is all for Satan. Like, there's even like a shot 
of young Lee as a little girl standing by her bed and looming over her just is like just like Black Coat's yeah, daughter it's great, just is like the daughter. is the the black silhouette of Satan yeah. of of Lucifer. When they first started this very exposition heavy, you know, flashback, I had some concerns about it because like in a movie that felt very oblique and kind of abstracted yeah it's uh, a little too direct having, having it be so direct i wasn't sure about but as it went on it felt additive enough to me that i didn't mind it i resented it it's my it's my biggest critique about the movie the this flashback yes. and again i wanted to phrase it with pra- frame it with praise yeah. and i get what they were doing like i understand that it's it's a chilling children's tale and all the rest but but it, at its core this is a detective film and it's about the mystery of it. And I would like to try and solve it. Thank you. And to to have, before we have all of the information, like clearly put it in front of us, to spell it all out quite literally with a monologue, I found to be pretty frustrating. I would have much preferred, all I needed really, like all I would ask for is is to have the monologue removed. Again, I understand the purpose of it. It's the mother telling telling her, I wish I could have just seen the imagery and put it together myself. Mm, yeah. Because even with the imagery there, it's everything you need. We see we see all these things happen literally. It just, it felt, I know it wasn't because of how it's artistically framed, but it still, it felt like an executive note. It felt like, oh, we have to spell this out for the audience. It felt like Harrison Ford's narration in Blade Runner. I did not like it. Here's, you know what? I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually say that what I think I would like a little bit better is the inverse of that. I would, but the where, visuals are so cool. Where I mean, look, the whole movie looks great, obviously, <laughs> but I would almost rather if if we're if we're erring on the side of more of the ambiguity of the black coat's daughter, I would favor more this obviously deranged character of her mother explaining the story as she sees it without us literally seeing it. So there's still some kind of that there's still room for reasonable doubt, right? That like whether this is literal or or uh, more sort of uh, abstract, vague and inexplicable. Like obviously, these family, like these these fathers killed their families, and like that is weird. But it's like when you get into the nitty gritty of like the magic orbs inside the skulls of these dolls that are channeling Satan's evil magic. It's like I, when that's when that's literalized, like it. <sighs> I, 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 I disagree. Honestly. I've kind of I've kind of come around on it because I'm because again I'm trying to meet the movie on its terms. Yeah. And what I'm expecting from it is not what it's trying to do. So like I think in terms of how it executes what it's trying to do, it does it very well. It's maybe not necessarily yeah, I what I would prefer, absolutely but absolutely necessary for the film in order for the final sequence to hit as hard as it does. Sure. Because yeah. you need the the lack of ambiguity that it gives yeah, for see, that scene to hit as hard as it does. I agree. I, I I agree. I'm I'm willing to concede that. I I'm willing to concede that like like we need we need to at least understand what is happening and what is at stake for the final scene to work. I'm with you on that. I agree. What I specifically and that that is why <laughs> I specifically just don't like that we have to see it and also hear it be said. That that was the moment for me where the spell was broken like where i like my trance my my state of wonder and fear and uncertainty was taken away from me well yeah like, i think and, and, I, and i really think it just it all comes down to like the fucking adr it all comes down to like the, the like that i think it's be... i think it's more than the adr i i i agree with you that that is where any mystery, any sense of ambiguity or anything is thrown out the window. It's like in the the in terms of the procedural of solving the mystery, it's like that is gone. At I that mean, the point. mystery is over at that point. Yeah, the mystery you the know? mystery is fine. solved. That, that, it's, Kevin even, Spacey has revealed himself as the yeah, killer. Yeah, so to yeah, speak. It's, it's sure. True. Like yeah. even even in like a a mystery thriller or whatever, like this is the part where we know who it is and now we have to catch them. Right, 
like this is this is the bit where the mystery is solved. There's it also is just specifically how the mystery is solved in that it is just clearly like spoken that I I I just I didn't like I, think I, I just wanted to see it. It's generally voice. I think there's something to be said yeah. for the fact that when you're kind of set up to be trying to like solve a procedural mystery from like the police like it like an empirical investigator's perspective that when it's relegated to magic that there feel there is something that feels kind of stolen from you a little bit but at the same time, true also, blood is a great example. But, not true, blood, sorry. <laughs> true detective, <laughs> true detective. Yeah. Uh, oh, season four. Uh, no, I, I mean season one. That's all I've seen. See, like, like season one of True Detective, we still don't know if it's a cult or not, and it works. Oh, oh, okay. I see. You see f- from the other perspective. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, True Detective is like one of the best examples of that. Yeah. But at the same time, also, like the movie does, like that's why the movie does go out of its way early on to sort of establish this, like. Lee being half psychic thing and like that ends up being part of long leg spell right like part of the reason why he lets her live and why he's writing these letters and stuff is because he's leading her to this this final culmination in fact my theory is that's why he calls himself long legs at all because in that opening scene with her when she's trying to take his picture and he says, I wore my long legs today, all of the letters that he's writing, that he's signing long legs, those letters are written to her Mm -hmm. with the express purpose knowing that 20 years later, he's going to give her that cipher and she's going to be able to decipher all of those letters that he's left her. So he's signing them with something that he said to her that day to sort of like tweak that sense memory that when she sees the photograph later and remembers it and clicks, it's like, oh yeah, I remember what he said to me that day. I wore my long legs today. It's like, that's why he's, I think that's why he, he is calling himself long legs. And it's so so important to note, like something I I don't know, I can't remember if we've mentioned or not, is that specifically like this, the, what culminate, like what brings us to this revelation is she goes inside to meet her mother. Her mother isn't there. We cut back outside. The mother shoots the The other other FBI FBI agent. And what's really interesting is that she goes around to the far side, to the passenger or the driver's side of the vehicle and shoots her once there. It's an over-under shotgun. And then she goes around to the other other side side of the car and shoots shoots her with the other barrel. And I think there's some intent here. And again, maybe I'm reading into it too deeply. Very possible. Um, I love to do that. But uh, I think Oz Perkins is an intentional director. Yes. And um, uh, that there is, there is this further cements that idea of polarity in the film of, (laughs) of inversion and of opposite sides of seeing things from two angles, of from being in two places at the same time, of of the of the upstairs and the downstairs, right? Of the doll and the girl. Yeah. And uh and then after this, uh uh she uh, our protagonist, she hears the gunshot, she runs outside, and the mother is now in the side yard with the doll of our protagonist sitting mm-hmm. in a chair and she's got the gun reloaded and pointed at it, and then pointed at her. And it, it's at that point where she says to the mother, hey, look, Long Legs is dead. It's all over. You can stop, or whatever. And she says, oh. Like, like no, he's free. Th- in that case, he's free. And she turns, and she shoots the doll. And she's like, well, yeah, and you're about to be free, too. too. She shoots the doll, breaking the spell. And and we see the, the doll's head explode, and also the ball inside the doll's head it cracks open and a black mist comes out of it and we cut quickly we cut back to our protagonist and we see a black mist behind her head also yeah immersed. give um, me that thing your dark soul your dark soul that, that <laughs> give me big uh, alan wake two vibes in terms of Haven't how played. they use yeah you're the only you're the only one of us who's played that but yeah. you're also not the only one i've seen compare long legs to alan wake too so i'm interested to play yeah, that yeah, now. Me too. yeah i played uh, the first one so the you know like there's this sort of like 
satanic spell, spiritual soul conjuring that has been placed inside of these dolls. Yeah. Right? That, like, the magic of Satan is is within That's them. what hypnotizes the family. And, it's what hypnotizes the yeah, people. And, and yeah, and it's always worked into the soul of these young, perfect girls, right? Like, of, of these, like... Again, little like angels, these, these little as, angels, lo- as Long these, Legs continuously these, calls them. These sacred things, right? What better sacrifice to Satan than a little angel? And the what's so fucking cool about this is again like like you know like so a, a part of her entire childhood of all these things that she can't remember is sort of all inside of the doll right like it's all been put inside of this thing as opposed to her that's why she yeah. has no memory of all this stuff it's why none of this makes sense it's why she's been freed and when she's freed that's when it all comes back and it's to the her. source of her power her psychicness or whatever yes her ability you know because yes yeah, she's sort of in both realms and also, this she's, is a, bit, she's a puppet been, of Satan. I've been foreshadowing this whole time, is where I get to once again gush about the cinematography. That the whole point of the boxes is that we're viewing this whole thing from the inside of her doll in a box. The whole movie. The duality, the breaking of the 180, like, of, like, seeing things from opposite sides with hard cuts. And where do they find that first doll? In a space under the floor, under in like the a thing. in yeah. like a box, looking above under the and floor below. in the barn, like yeah. it's all it all works into the visuals of this movie in a way I haven't seen before. And so whenever we're looking at our protagonist through a door frame, we're seeing here as a doll in a box. It's so fucking cool, man. She's the man in the box. Like it's sick. whoa, another movie where Cleveland has an <laughs> opportunity to reference the Allison Chain song I've been "Man in on the that Box" shit this whole time. Wow, you know? I like, can't believe but, it. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think possibly more fitting than ever. But um, uh, I love this. I, I love. I, I just I love that like breaking of the one eighty. Those hard cuts back and forth. Often sometimes with long legs, legs talking to a victim. Where uh, and it, it, it's so cool that like it's. Like, cause, cause he's also the puppet, the puppet master, and so we're we're flitting back and forth, and they're also one in the same. It's it's terrifying and chilling, and uh, I I love it. I love it to bits. I think it's extremely cool, and and again, I think it's enough on its own. Like, I, I didn't need them to say it literally for me, and I wish they hadn't, because that that's where like it just again to me it, it takes it too far. Like, I love all the themes, I love all these elements, and I love I love being able to to grasp them and uh and to appreciate them in a way that again leading up to that moment was is it's it's like how how i i I love i loved my interaction with the lighthouse right we watched that movie years ago and we got to sit down in the podcast and in the podcast like oh it's promethean it's the flame right like the movie never says it the movie never stops and tells us in a monologue the, the whole deal with young and old, right? Yeah. The movie allows us to accept that on our own terms. It gives us everything we need. It still unveils it to us. It still reveals these things, but it reveals it to us like in its own world and like uh, within its own mechanisms and operations. And we get to just take in the fucking art. But here, they literally have to spell it out for us. They literally have to tell it to us in a monologue, uh, and I didn't like. You know, it. I no, I would argue that I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily. It's not necessarily what I prefer. I agree with you on that, but like, I do think that the movie does it by its own mechanisms and its own terms. Yeah. That like feels that like it. It, By doing it's not, it through like a story the mother is telling. Yeah, it's not it's not necessarily the subtlety that I no, that I would ask that I would for ask for, but I think know? it like, I think it does I think it does do it on its I think it does do it on its own terms. Yeah, I don't know. Like it I just again, felt like I was being I, talked about. Again, I think it's critical though. You know, I think it's the same kind of reason they introduced the half psychic stuff earlier. Yeah. Because they need the audience to completely buy into this to the point where there's no ambiguity. You know what? You know what I think. You think that like like showing it would have done the same. You know what I think it is. The audio, if her narration had just been cut, and we still see everything. You know what I think it is. She carries the doll to the family. She does all the stuff. It still does that. It's still like, but it's just with to me. It's just compounded with. I think I, I think I can distill it. I think really, I think really at its core, the problem is the shot. Of the silhouette of Satan looming over Young Lee. No, it's so I cool think, though. No, well, here, okay, hear me out. <laughs> hear me out. I think that so in, bad. I think that in that flashback, 
it's just a step too far. And here's why I'm in favor of removing it there, because they have a much cooler use of the oh, Satan yeah. silhouette just in the door. after this in yes in the the final the the final scene of this movie is lee going to her boss's uh house because the daughter his daughter invited her over to her birthday it's her ninth birthday it's on the 14th uh, and her mom brings the doll whatever so she goes there and as she's going into the house when the door closes behind it's so her good, it's again it's just for like a frame before it cuts they don't linger on it but as the door swings closed you get just a split second of the silhouette the horned silhouette of Satan standing there in the doorway and i think if you nix the shot in the flashback the long shot of the silhouette of Satan standing over young Lee. If you nix it there and you just keep it at that scene right there where you just have it for a split second, like blink and you miss it. And probably also cut the mom literally saying we're agents of Satan. And doing this uh, she, Satan. she says, she says hail Satan like long legs does again. It's on the nose, but like, She's under long legs spell. He's hypnotized her. It's, you know, hail, hail Satan. At the very end, like after it's all over, like the last shot before the credits is we cut back to long legs in the interrogation room doing mugging at the camera. And he says, hail Satan. But this time he does a kissy face. He goes, he kisses at the camera <laughs> and then credits. It's pretty great. Roll, play T-Rex. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's talk about that final sequence, though, with the family, like some more. It is really good. Yeah, it's terrifying. The turn of the film is this monologue where, you know, it's essentially revealed that, like, this movie has never been a mystery. Like, it's all been kind of the work of Long Legs and Satan. Yeah. Kind of, you know, pulling the strings and getting up to this point. Leading, leading Lee to this yeah. moment. Yeah. Yeah. And Lee goes to her boss's house and, uh, quickly realizes that they are under the spell. Her mom's already there. Um, She's delivered the doll. The, the whole the family the is under the spell. The kind yeah. of caressing the doll very lovingly. And uh, there's some very stilted dialogue between the parents. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, let's go into the kitchen to cut the cake. Oh, well, yeah, because they, they kind of call out the direction of it, which is fine. Like the... And, and the mom is like, and then we'll come back with the cake. And then I was like, no, I'll come back with the cake. You You'll still, still be in, in the, the kitchen. kitchen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they go into the kitchen. And you just, like, it's just almost hear funny. the sounds of him it just like funny. stabbing, stabbing yeah. the what, shit out of What I love yeah. is like the, the, the tone in which they deliver that dialogue is very almost mundane. Yeah. But it's very... Yeah, it's well, it's, well, it's cool because... It's like, puppet the, theater. Yeah, exactly. The dad, yeah. like, the, the, the FBI agent, like, do, does an incredible... Perf I mean, him and the wife, too, but, like, he does an incredible performance of it because, like, throughout the movie, we've sort of seen, like, his mannerisms, and he has, like, kind of a sharp response to things quite often. He's um, a nice foil to Lee in a lot of the movie in that, like, he is more expressive and emotional and, compared and also, to Lee's kind of stoicism. He, he, yeah. he protects her and is also sort of a father figure to her too, mm -hmm. which which makes, again, this this work even better. That's not just a family, right? Like, it's, it's this person is, like, this whole family is like, very, like it, it have, have touched our protagonist and us. But um, but he's shown off these certain mannerisms and they, they, they a lot of them are, are like just beneath the surface. Like, his head will cock a little bit and like, He'll say something, and it'll end it a little bit sharp, like, when he's saying these lines about the kitchen. And you can just feel that, much like Lee throughout this whole movie, like, he's just under the surface watching all of this happen as he's being puppeted, right? The whole family is. But, like, we know this because we've seen how he's acted before now, and he's so different from that. And it keeps trying to emerge, like, he knows, oh my god, this thing is going to make me kill my whole family, and it knows it, and there's nothing I can do about it. And I it's love, chilling. I love how you get elements of that earlier in the movie. There's a, a voice recording of, like, a call to the police where one of the fathers is like, uh, you know, my family isn't my family. There's something about them. Yeah. You know? And it's playing into those themes, right? Like, they are being controlled but powerless to do anything about it, ultimately. Yeah.
it's clear that the father went to the kitchen to kill. Yeah, I mean, you and... you hear you hear him stabbing her many many times in the kitchen as Lee sort of stands on in horror, and he comes back in and tries to attack her. Lee shoots him. Then Lee shoots her mom, not before her mom gets to also mug the camera and say, Hail Satan. Well, she um, pulls a knife. Like yeah, a... she yeah she pulls a knife and tries to tag her, so Lee's forced to shoot her own mother. And then she goes to try to break the spell on the daughter by shooting the doll, but every time she yeah. pulls the trigger, it's empty. Well, what's super important about that is before the mom dies, she says, this has to happen or else we'll be kind of writhing and burning and writhing and burning or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, and twist. She yeah. specifically twist says, burn. we'll twist and burn. Yeah. We'll twist and burn. And she says it the same way as twist and shout because that's what the fucking Mansons wrote on the wall in blood, which which has been touched on a few times. Oh, yeah. So, like, yeah, no, that's a, that's a specific, like, reference to the Mansons. The, I mean, the Carver or Carver yeah, earlier on literally the film, they, referenced they say that Manson. there, too, yeah, because earlier, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's the Manson family. Twist and burn, these, yeah. yeah. like, kind of satanic killings. Like, it all plays back in. The mom also has some, like, hippie <laughs> vibes that kind of, kind of yeah. you know, like, resonate with that, too. But no, I, I love that. It's yeah, it's that it's that twist and shout. Like we're all fucking. Oh, I mean, yeah. there's almost an element of like, if this doesn't happen, the the fate of things is almost going to be worse. Yeah, well, it kind of feels like it. Yeah, it kind of yeah, it, it, feels like it's, it doesn't. It's, revela it's revelation. Yeah, it kind of feels like it doesn't matter. It's that like, no matter what, they're all damned. Like this, it, I mean, again, it's like the movie ends right after this, you know, with the cut back to, to long leg saying hail Satan and the credits roll going the opposite direction down instead of up. Cute. And it's like, uh, again, those T-Rex plays for some reason. Um, but it's like, yeah, it's so fucking bleak. It's like Satan wins, uh, in this is like the, everybody, everybody involved is, is damned. Like, the the devil just got a crop of souls off of this one, and there's there's no hope of of redemption or salvation or anything. Like well, God is dead. What what's so horrifying to me about the ending is, uh, you know, where if the ritual was completed, you know, you'd have some finality to things, or if she sh ended up shooting the doll, you'd have kind of the the veil being lifted, much mm -hmm. like. Ha yeah. what happened to her I was, once the doll right. was shot but because she uh wasn't able to shoot the doll the yeah she keeps the, pulling the trigger and it doesn't the presence shoot. Yeah. continues on yep. past the edges of the frame of satan will continue to loom over yeah. everything and uh yeah and so you no, mean satan allowed her mom to kill the to blow up her doll earlier because yeah, it's because it's, 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 it's necessary it's like yeah. yeah satan satan allows what what he will well, because now, and that's like, why again she was allowed to grow up she wasn't killed when she was nine with her family because her mother became instrumental and in setting up all of this for this final culmination it was all by the allowance of long legs and the allowance of satan and it's worth noting too that like before before we cut she has a sort of look of like kind of giving up and acceptance. Like the, she brings the gun down after yeah. she tries to shoot it a couple of times. Like, and that's where Satan was. Well, what does she have left? She's right. just, she's well, killed her boss. I'll she's tell you what she has left. Mother. She has, she has a doll and now a girl. She's become her mother in this, right? Like she, or something like now, like, cause now the young girl is there with her. She has to protect it. The doll is still going to live and likely the cycle will continue. Um, what I was kind of expecting to happen, I'm glad the beast has many heads. What I was expecting to happen is that she was going to shoot the doll and then walk out with the doll. Like, like, like assuming that she'd shot the girl. Oh, she shot the kid. Like that's, instead. that's what I was expecting they were going to do. Mm -hmm. Is it I'm like, glad that they did. Me too. I, yeah. I'm glad, but like, it is, it is sort of like what you're setting up to think. Like she's got the gun pointed at the doll. She's holding the girl and it's like, oh no, she's actually going to kill the girl. And, yeah. You know, but she'll have thought because of the puppetry or whatever. But, um, no, they don't do that. Like it just, it, it just ends there. Um, and you know, in that respect, it is ambiguous. It does leave us wondering. But still, no matter what happens, it's not good. Yeah, I, I don't mean, think I don't think I, it's really I, that it, ambiguous. Yeah, it's just no, pretty, it just a definitively bad ending. We just yeah. don't see. Like, it's and just, what, yeah. what, yeah, what I find especially horrifying about it is like, it's almost sort of a classic Faustian bargain, right? Like, yeah, by allowing t sure. her to live, she's a witness to all of these horrors because like atrocities are even worse when there's 
someone to kind of bear witness to yeah. it. And and this is something that I'm glad that the movie doesn't doesn't outright say, but obviously like it's it's reference to the book of Revelation is like what is what is like the, the most quotable line from Revelation is when each of the angels opened the seal and he said, Come and see. There's like there's this this aspect of of somebody having to be in, to in the case witness. of Revelation, John being like the witness, mm-hmm. you know, the angel opened the seven seal, come and see. And I saw the pale horse and like, that is Yo, look like at this shit. she, yeah, exactly. She, come, come and see, look at this shit. Like you have to bear witness. That is the revelation. That's her. That's, that's Lee in this. Like she is the witness. She is the one who is invited to come and yeah. see. Yeah. Um, all right, we should probably rate this. This is yeah, maybe one of our, lo- uh, one of our longest like. episodes ever. Um, yeah, let's. Uh, who wants to start? Not me. Oh, fuck. I'll start. Yeah, you start. Uh, I think I, I mean, know what I'm going to give. Honestly, this, but... like, I was a bit skeptical on the Oz Perkins train. Like, I had misgivings about Black Coat's daughter. Still do to an extent. And uh, like I. This one the most. You should didn't, revisit it. I didn't like Gretel and Hansel yeah. all that much. Um, but now I'm all aboard the fucking Oz Perkins train. Choo choo. I think. This is the perfect culmination of his his skills as an aesthetician, I guess you could say. It perfectly nails the aesthetic, um, but also gives a little more to grasp and kind of uh, in kind of avoiding ambiguity in this film, I think it becomes all the more horrifying, in my opinion. Uh, I love kind of the plays on... Pro- police procedurals and kind of supernatural tinge stuff like uh stuff like cure and alan wake 2 and twin peaks i think this is a masterpiece i this is easily my favorite movie of the year uh five out of five yeah yeah you know what i i think i'm gonna ditto the five out of five i wasn't totally sure where i was gonna land at the start of this episode as i've said a few times like i've had to sort of talk myself and y'all have had to talk me into sort of meeting this film on its own terms based on my expectations of it but um yeah you know i i I do think that it is uh that it's it's really strong and just the fact that like even though i came out of it with some misgivings the fact that i have been like pretty much thinking about it nonstop for the last 24 hours, like even in my dreams, that says something. It's like, that's something that sticks with you. And like, I, I'm eager to see it again so I can come into it with a new viewing fully ready to meet it on its own terms. But you know what? Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to ditto the five out of five. Oh dear. Clave. That's okay. You do not like you, I, you feel yeah. you feel lesser. You do not, no, do not feel going, the yeah. pressure to make this well, golden pie. I, I think if anything though, Go with like, your honest you guys I think that's fine. giving it a five out of five, like I think kind of further cements in like my own personal score in my mind because it just even with the pressure, I feel I, I, I feel like a four point five is is where I'm at with this film right now. Honestly, I expect you to go lower. Um, yeah. No, 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 no. Like 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 again, like it's it's a gripe. Um I resent it. And I certainly did in the moment. Like, again, we, we've kind of bounced it back and forth. And I, and I see your points, but during my experience of viewing the film, that was the moment for me where, like I said, the spell sort of felt broken. Which is kind of fitting that it, I will say, in fairness, that is the moment where the spell is also Literally broken the protagonist. Literally yeah. I, I, I allow that. I, I, you, that is true. But it, it is also the moment where the fear was, like, I was taken out of the film. Where the, sure. the fear was taken from me in my personal experience and and I wish that I wish it wasn't I, I I wish that I was still like trapped uh within the box trapped within the confines of the film uh and left there forever and I feel like if that hadn't happened I would have been I really wanted to be able to kind of think it through and piece it together myself and I just felt like that sequence sort of robbed me of that opportunity in a way that also just felt like something that needed to be there for the sake of general audiences and I don't and I resent that and uh, so for that, very specifically, I'm just going to give it a 4.5. But again, like I mean, I think that's else, still very generous. The, it's high praise. It's an incredible film. It is very yeah. generous, and it's deserved. I love, I love all of the performances in the film for all the reasons we've said. Maybe, maybe with another viewing, I'll, 
I'll, I'll give it a, I'll, I'll bump it to a five, but uh, yeah, I am, I am sorry to not allow it to be a golden pod. Bye. bye That's okay. Breath. I don't care. Um, well, that, <laughs> that'll give, that'll give long legs a, uh, a strong 4.8 out of five and a resounding recommendation. Um, yeah. I mean, if you haven't seen it and you sat through all the spoilers, like definitely go see it. If you have a chance to catch it in theaters, do so. It's worth it. Before we get into next week's episode, we have some prediction results from Maxine yeah, last week. Yeah, we do. Let's roll through those real uh, quick. Okay, so let's start with box office. I predicted 5.2 mil. Cleview predicted 15 mil. And Tisu predicted 8 mil. Uh, it did 6.7 million. So just barely, t got that yeah. Oh, shit. Nice. Yeah, I thought you might have had that one. Fuck uh, yeah. For Rotten Tomatoes, I predicted 93, much like the other two films got. Uh, Cleveview predicted 91. TC predicted 82. Currently, it's sitting at 74. Yeah! (laughs) Won it by lowballing. Got another one. Diminishing returns. Uh, In terms of collective rating, I predicted 4.2. Cleveview predicted 5. And TC predicted 4.6. Ah, uh, you got that by, one by low, by ball, low like, ball. Yeah, I got it. And nice. considering we all gave it the same score, there's no person yeah. who rated it the highest. Second week in a row we've done that. Yeah. Um, in terms of comments, I said at least one small cameo will make us laugh hard. And, you know, I could I could say Giancarlo Esposito or Kevin Bacon. Yeah, they both had um, hard laugh. They both had good moments. Yeah. Uh, Cleve, you said movie good. Debatable. Yeah. Eh. Kind of. Uh, movie, all right. Oh, well. Can't win all. Uh, TC said, wild card prediction, Maxine turns out to be the Night Stalker and somehow frames Richard Ramirez for it. Yeah, Babe, Babe Ruth turning around and pointing <laughs> into the backfield on that one. Although, I mean... Her dad does kind of do that. He's yeah. he's not framing not as Richard. As he's I not framing Richard wanted, Ramirez, yeah. but he he passing his killings off as Night Stalker slang. So I don't know. There's something there. It's so, a bunt yeah. rather than a home run. Maybe you got two points, T. So I got one point nice. from that one. So all right. Well, uh, next week, um, as far as we know, right now, still kind of tentative, but we should be going back to the movies next week. Oddity is coming out. We predicted yeah, the new, this one. Uh, Damien McCarthy movie. The director of Caveat. We did an episode on that a couple of years ago. You can go back and listen to that. Uh, some other, uh, yeah. another net supernatural movie with a doll in it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, come come back and listen to that. Presumably next week. Uh, yeah. Just because we've gone super fucking long, let's just skip the sponsor this week and wrap yeah, up. I'm with it. Um, if you like the show, then uh, please leave us a five star rating and review, uh, and share an episode with a friend or something. Uh, help us get in more people's ears. Become a Patreon supporter. Patreon dot com slash Pod People Pod. Shout out to our honorary Pod boys, Sam, Zach, Micah, and Mitchell. As always, y'all rule. Um, you can also, of course, follow us at letterbox.com slash pod people pod, where you'll find a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings, links, to those reviews. Um, I'm going to do kind of a broad recommendation this week, unrelated to long legs or anything. At the time of recording, we just lost the great Shelley Duvall a couple of days ago. Um, obviously I think what most people would recognize her from is The Shining, great film that we've talked about on the podcast that we love, of course, but I'm going to recommend some other, uh, maybe lesser, uh, mm-hmm. known and appreciated Shelley Duvall roles, uh, specifically in the films of Robert Altman. Yeah. She was in a bunch of his shit, um, and Popeye. yeah, Popeye, <laughs> of course, uh, as olive oil, but, uh, uh, stuff like even like small roles like McCabe and Mrs. Miller, uh, Nashville, really great in that. Three but women. Three Women is like a really uh, uh, she's she's a leading role in that and a really cool, mysterious kind of transcendent uh, performance from Shelley Duvall in a in a weird, cool film by Robert Altman. So I mean, yeah, obviously. R.I.P. Shelley Duvall. Um, go watch go watch her in the films of Robert Altman. That's my recommendation this week. Hell yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to do a dual recommendation. Uh, if you liked Long Legs, 
which I hope by the end of this episode you do, if you didn't already, uh, go check out either Alan Wake 2, which is a fantastic video game. Honestly, I'm not a big fan of the first Alan Wake. This one takes it, takes a lot of the ideas and kind of fully forms them in a way that only a post-control sort of remedy could do. Um, amazing use of full motion video in really unique and novel ways. Um, really cool game. Um, and also uh, the TV show The Outsider. Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, also yeah, plays into procedural that. themes with supernatural elements. Yeah, absolutely. Um, fantastic show. My recommendation this week is just going to be uh, the, uh, the, the concept of uh, taking a walk to think about stuff. You, why don't you use your long legs? Use your long legs. <laughs> get out and take a walk. Stretch those long you legs. You know what? Even if your legs are short, get out and use them. Yeah. <laughs> Th- thanks, Cleve, for recommending the concept of oh, taking a walk. To think about things. <laughs> to, th- to think about things. <laughs> to think about long legs, maybe. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, yeah. yeah I, 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 like, it was a late night walk, too. You know, I'm not, I'm not one for, for taking walks at like 11 p.m. Uh, but it, it felt right. I actually, specifically, I walked to a Duke Cathedral and I just took a little while to look at the beautiful architecture at night. Um, you know, I don't think I, I don't think I'm, I'm, I was allowed to be there. There's a security guard way down the way, but he never saw me. And I just, so I just kind of hung out and looked at the cathedral and figured out. The Duke campus is public. There are dorms there. I think if you were, if you were lurking, then maybe they'd ask you to leave. I was lurking a little bit, but you know, that's fine. You know, I'm not hurting anybody. Yeah. This, this time you're not... Take a walk. Yeah, t- take take about a, things. Take a walk. All right. Well, thank you for listening. And while and while you're walking, uh, bang the sure, gong. Bang bang a gong and take a moment. Twist and shout a little bit. Take a moment to uh, hail Satan. Hail Satan. <laughs>